Hello, I'm Paul Scotchford. I'm a data analyst. I live, work and play in Brisbane, Queensland, Australia. And welcome to this free course, The Hitchhiker's Guide to Writing SQL Queries. This is SQL 101. This is the foundation course you need to get yourself started in SQL. For whatever reason you're going to use it, you have to start somewhere. This course will give you exactly those skills you need. The course here will cover downloading the software first to get installed and we'll be using SQL Server Express 2014. SQL Server is a very, very popular database product and it's a large product that's used in many, many enterprises. So you can't really go wrong knowing something about SQL Server and TSQL. The SQL we learn here, aka SQL, is ANSI SQL, which means what you learn in this course, you can apply to Oracle, you can apply to MySQL, Postgres, and many other products that use ANSI SQL. So we're not doing any sort of exotic SQL here that you can't apply elsewhere. So once we've got the software installed, then we'll be looking at fundamental skill sets, which require a really good understanding of the anatomy of a SQL select query. And I'll take you through each of those components and I'll do some whiteboarding along the way and there'll be some pracs and quizzes as well during the presentations. The next component in the course will be table joins. Table joins are fundamental to your success with writing SQL queries. So you really need to understand how to interact with the data model to do this and I'll take you through that. I'll explain primary and foreign keys and how the table joins work in those contexts. The next section from there will be understanding some of the more basic aggregation type functions like sum, average, count and so on. And I'll teach you some tips and tricks within those as well, which will give you a bit more capability in the types of things you do. And then the last section will just cover off some more how to do type things such as backing up a database, how to do an insert. I've got a fairly comprehensive lecture for you in the insert statement, and that's a part of CRUD. CRUD is create, read, update, delete. So you'll see something on the create side, and there'll be some other components in that section as well. All right, so I'll see you in the course. If you've got any questions, feel free to get in touch with me. I'm here to help. Okay, see you there. Bye for now. All right, so for this course, we will need to download Microsoft SQL Server 2014 Express. The product itself is free of charge. You can download and install on your PC and keep it forever, or at least until the next version anyway. And it is sufficient for what we need to do in this course. So it will have all the functionality that we require and I'm going to show you how to download and install it. It's fair, It's a little lengthy, but that's only because of the processing time. Uh, a little laborious as it asks a lot of questions, but I'll walk you through each one. So the first thing to do is go to Microsoft. All right, so we're at Microsoft.com. Click the search box and we'll just search for SQL Server 2014, download. All right, now it won't show us what we require in the general information page, so click the support if it doesn't ordinarily come there by default. And we're interested in this one here. So click that URL link, and as you can see, we have the download button. Now, just as a tip, I would look at the system requirements. Please ensure your PC is as close or better to the configuration requirements here as possible. I would imagine most people have a PC that exceeds this config, but I just want to draw your attention to that. All right, click the download. Now, the only other thing you have to consider, there are two files here we're interested in, the Express and Tools 32-bit or the Express and Tools 64-bit. It's important you install the correct one. If you're a 32-bit machine, then by all means select that one and click the next. For me, I'm downloading 64-bit, so I'm going to click the Express and Tools 64-bit and then the next. And what will happen, because I'm in Chrome, the download started 
dynamically. So there it is. It's going to take about eight minutes. So I'll quickly pause the video because this will be like watching the grass grow. And when it's finished, I will have the kit on my desktop. And of course, I'll walk you through the installation. And here we go. We have the kit sitting on the desktop. All right, so I'm just going to double click it. And of course, Windows will always come back to confirm that I want to make changes to the computer. I'm just going to click yes. Now, for me, I'm just going to take the default directory that it offers for the extraction. It's just unpacking all of the CAB files. All right, so the unpacking has occurred. It's just going to go through to the SQL Server Installation Center. We are interested in this step only at this point to select New SQL Server Standalone Installations. We just click on that. And here we will be prompted with a number of options. So if you just select the options I select in this install, then we should have a nice, clean, smooth install. I have to accept the license terms. If I say no, then of course we go nowhere. It's doing a rule check. You can show the details if you're quick enough. I'm not worried about the check for updates as this is a clean install. It's just going to go through what its tasks are that it's going to process. Yes, this is a little bit tedious. I will try and clip this video so you don't have to wait too long whilst watching. Okay, so you'll notice that it's ticked all of the features by default. Accept those. Don't try to undo any. We want to use all of these. And you'll notice it will also check that the prerequisites are already installed. So ensure if, if your .NET framework is not up to date, and the minimum requirement is not there, you will get an error and it will ask you to address those issues before it proceeds. So as a rule, you'll probably find that you're up to date anyway if you've just maintained all of your updates on your PC. So just accept that and click Next and it will go through and get ready for the selection of your features for installation. This might take a number of seconds. Now, when we get to the instance configuration, we are interested in the default instance. Don't worry about named instances at this point. If you decide to move on into a server-based environment for SQL Server, then this becomes relatively important, depending on the size of your installation. But for this course, take the default, which is MS SQL Server. Click Next. Depending on your PC, this can take a few seconds or a bit longer. All right, so it's looking for service account configuration we can accept the defaults here the only catch i mentioned is the sql server browser this is the management studio this is our main the management studio will be our main interface into sql for our whole course i will demonstrate the features and navigational points for the management studio so you you become comfortable with all right so this account the service account is effectively the processes that will run in the background to drive your SQL Server database installation. So the engine will start automatically. The browser doesn't. We need to set it to automatic. We need that to fire up every time this, your PC reboots and so on, or you log out and log back in again. And if the service has stopped, it needs to restart. Otherwise, you just won't be able to communicate with the database. Now, this is not just for an express setup. This applies to all SQL Server. Just click the Next. Accept the authentication offerings. So we're interested in Windows authentication mode only. The server administrators, it will actually pick up you or your log login by default. So just accept that. So my login is my company name and it's accepted that by default. You can add others if you choose. If you're sharing this PC with other users, then of course you might want to add more users. Data directories, just have a look in there. When you become a little more advanced with SQL Server, you can actually set different directories. By default, it picks the C drive, but in a real server environment, we will naturally use different drives for our uh, databases. We also will partition databases across drives, but that becomes a, a DBA function, and we're not concerned with it here. Similarly, we'll have a backup directory by default, and I'll be teaching you a backup about backup and restores too, because a lot of the resources we need 
uh, on our Dropbox uh, shared area and I'll teach you how to download from Dropbox and do restores and backups inside the product so you'll understand everything as we move forward. Everything else you can just accept. So we'll just come back to the config and we'll click the next button. It's happy with everything, I'm happy with everything and it's just now going to go through the actual installation. Almost there. As you can tell, it takes a number of minutes to do the install and could be, well, it's designed for you to go and make a cup of coffee while you wait. That's it. The installation is done. Now, as you can see, there are a lot of questions to answer, but if you just follow this video step by step, you shouldn't have any problems whatsoever. I'm just going to close out of there. And if you just click on resources, I might have to click twice. Now, SQL Server Books Online. So here, if you just click on that, it'll take you to Microsoft's documentation page. And in here, I'm not going to go through this now. I'll teach you more about this later. But basically, set yourself up a bookmark in your browser for this because this is where everything is. This is your whole documentation set for SQL Server 2014. So I recommend you have a quick look around there. And I just want to show you one other thing. You remember I said to, I mentioned that there are services running. So I'm just going to go into computer management and just to show you that in the services, this is where SQL is actually running. So let's just scroll down. Here we go. I was looking for Microsoft. So the processes or the services that are running are Microsoft SQL Server, so that's the engine for this PC. That will always run. Even when you reboot, it will start up automatically. Now, we haven't set the agent to start because that is the batch processor. So you can run jobs on a scheduled basis within the SQL Server agent. But the course is not about that, so I'm going to leave that disabled for now. And it's done that by default, so you don't have to worry about anything. The browser, now you remember in the install, we set the startup to be automatic because previously it was disabled. Anytime you want to use the management suite, this service must be running. So for any point in time, you can't run the management suite or you cannot connect to a database instance, such as MS SQL Server, the one we created at install time, check your services. It's likely they're not running. Okay, to start a service, it's a simple case of clicking the start, but you might just want to double check the properties to ensure it's set to automatic. It's really that simple. So bear that in mind if you have any issues, but of course, if you get stuck, send me an email and I'll endeavor to answer it as quickly as possible. All right, so that's all there is for the installation. It's very straightforward. And in the next lecture, we're going to talk about how do you get to these, the resources that are on offer for the course. So you're going to need a database. In other words, the data that we're going to use during the course, I've pre-prepared. And I'm going to show you in the next lecture how to download it. All right, I'll see you in the next lecture. All right, anytime you're interacting with a database product, be it SQL Server, Oracle, or MySQL, and so on, there will be a product that is supplied by the vendor, in this case Microsoft, to allow us to interact with the product for creating various queries, functions, database design diagrams, and so on. Now that product for us is known as SQL Server 2014 Management Studio, and by default, it doesn't create a desktop uh, shortcut for you, so we actually have to go and find it. So if you're in Windows 8, then the best way to find it is actually do a search. And for me, so that I can bring up the query, I'm just going to type in SQL. And as you can see, there is the Management Studio. Now, let's pin that to the taskbar, and we'll just exit back out of there. And there it is, there's the icon for running it. Now, if you're in Windows 7, then you'll need to open up your uh, program bar, as you see here. And then you'll see your list of programs and you'll be selecting the SQL Server Management Studio to pin via 
this list. Now this is just a screen dump because I'm not actually running Windows 7, but this is where you'll find it. Now this is an old version as you can see, but the configuration will stay the same in terms of your list. Alright, so let's move right on. I'm just going to click on the icon. It'll open up the software as we can see. Now, by default, it will attempt to connect to the installed server instance using Windows authentication. So the server name in this case is Tim Tam. Tim Tam is just a chocolate biscuit that I rather like that we have in Australia, and I do believe they're actually available in other countries, but that's by the by. And Windows authentication has picked up my default username in this case. All right, so this is a, uh, a, a fictitious environment I've created, especially for this course. Now I'm ready to connect, so all we have to do is connect and what will happen, you'll notice on the left hand side of the window, you can see the instance we've connected to, SQL Server TimTam, the username of the person, in this case me, and the version. So currently 2014 is version 12.0.2000. All right, we don't need to know much about that for this exercise. Now there are a number, of, a number of folders, so it kind of looks like a folder explorer, even though it's termed object explorer. So in this case, bulk of the work we'll be doing is in here, in the databases list. Now presently we don't have anything in there, we will build this up over time, but by default there are a set of system databases installed as a part of the installation of SQL Server. These system databases we do not need to be concerned with. They are purely there for DBAs, developers, and the management of the product in itself. But for this course, we do not need to touch them. And I recommend you don't tinker with these because you could easily break your installation. All right, so they're there purely as a repository for managing SQL Server in general. The security folder, we're not interested again in setting up any security here because this is not a DBA or security based course. Server objects, we will probably have a little bit of a look around in the backup devices because we'll be doing some backups and restores just so that you know how to protect your work if you're busily doing data analysis, etc., you might want to just save that occasionally to ensure that nothing happens, uh, nothing disastrous happens to your work. Uh, link servers, for what they're worth, there are other ways to connect to other databases, SQL Server, Oracle, and so on, but we won't go into there. Uh, similarly, we won't worry about triggers at this point in time. These are covered, they're more extensive subject matter to be covered in other courses. It doesn't affect us for what you want to do. Uh, replication is just, an, as it suggests, uh, copying databases around a network based upon the requirements of an op enterprise and operation. And then management itself, there's uh, SQL Server logs, feel free to open one of those up just by doing a view and you can see all of the action that's taken place within SQL Server. All right, so that's very straightforward. The ribbon across the top of Management Studio offers you a number of features. Of course, as you're familiar with most products in Microsoft, there's always a file menu. Okay, you can, for example, open recent files. And we can set the number of files also. There's a various number of options available to you in this uh, interface. Editor, of course, when you're querying, uh, building queries, then all of the normal text edit options are available. Uh, a view, this is a little bit more advanced. We won't really have much of a use for this at this point in time. We might dip into it occasionally. Debug, we're not writing any major scripts here that run from an operational point of view. So for example, if I was writing a complex script that was building um, other data sources or targets, I should say. For example, I'm running some ETL, I might want to debug. So it's similar to programming debugging. You can step through each line. 
tools again there's some tools here that are more important for dbas developers and so on for example the sql profiler i can use just to trace uh, various events within uh, the server itself but as we're a single user i don't have a need for it here there's the normal window options of course and then there's help help is excellent there is a comprehensive help library now in the old days we used to install this help library on the system but now we can get it online it will give you a great deal more information that's constantly up to date so i recommend you click the manage help settings ignore this error if you do receive it now choose online or local well because we've not installed books online locally then what I want to do is select this button here. OK, I'm just going to unselect it and select it just to bring back the OK button to demonstrate the use. So if I click OK there and exit, now anytime I need help, I can just go view help. And what it will do is take me to the top of the help library. In other words, everything is here open, laid open for you to review. Now, once you've had a look at that and decided to um, carry on, then you will find also that the help is very context sensitive. So for example, if I click new query, which is our main editor window for writing queries, and if I'm going to just say select star from some table, and then just, you didn't see me do this, but I'm just gonna say from here, I can drag and drop these, but I'll cover more of this later. If I'm uncertain as to what select really means, then if I click F1, then it will take as an argument the select verb and present all of the related documentation for it. And as you can see, it is quite extensive. There's also a very strict syntax and so on. Now, some of it's more relevant to SQL Azure, so I wouldn't worry about any references to Azure for this course. But for now, you have a lot of information available for understanding various functions, verbs, syntax within SQL Server. However, I'm going to teach you a hell of a lot here, so this will act as a way to enhance what you're already learning. I use this as well. There are times you cannot conceivably remember every single construct within a product like SQL Server or even Oracle, for example. Indeed, you will, if it's not commonly done by you, then you will indeed return to the help just to recap on what the syntax should or shouldn't be. All right, now, there's a lot more in here I want to show you, but I really don't want to overwhelm you at this point. We've been running for 10 minutes now, but suffice you to say this interface is how we will be interacting with our databases. And as we move through our various lectures, I will explain how to restore databases, how to utilize the data within, how we're going to do our queries, etc. So anything we need to do in here, I will go through step by step anything we haven't already covered. All right, so I'm going to end the lecture here. And what we'll do is in the next lecture, we're just going to discuss what a SQL query is all about. That'll just be a couple of minutes of overview to understand what the query construct is made of. OK, so I'll see you in the next lecture. All right, what is a relational database? Well, by definition, and if you do a search, you'll find on Wikipedia this rather nice little phrase that says it's a digital database whose organization is based on the relational model as proposed by Mr. Edgar F. Codd in 1970. Ted Codd was a computer scientist that worked for IBM back in the 70s and beyond. And rest in peace, Ted, he passed away in April 2003. But he's pretty much the father for relational database technologies that we know today. The relational database itself is fairly simple in its 
implementation. It's only our designs and our systems that can build it up to be quite complex in nature. Fundamentally, when you installed SQL Server Express on your PC, you, you might remember it asks you for a bunch of folder directories so you could actually specify where certain files live, such as your data files, your backups, and so on. So but predominantly for what we're going to do, your databases will be stored within a single database file, such as when I find a pen. So if you create a database called um, customers, it will create a file called customers.mdf and it will also create a customers log.ldf. Now this file is in a larger enterprise, uh, online transaction processing enterprise and so on. This LDF file is the log file as it suggests by the suffix here. The log file gives you the ability to roll back transactions that have changed data. So in other words, and this all gets into a whole different management topic which we don't need to worry about here, but if you were to update, for example, you're a bank and you've gone in to withdraw some money, uh, the bank's going to, one, hand over your money, but part of that process is it's going to decrement your balance and it's also going to write another record summary within its transaction systems. Those two transactions have to be synced, in other words, coordinated, and what we have is what's known as a multi-phased commit. So, but this is transactional theory, which we won't cover here, but fundamentally, if something happens, let's say the, um, the bank teller loses connection to the data, to the system, then of course that transaction needs to be rolled back because they don't want to take money out of your account and not update it. Um, that's great for you as a customer because you can take $100 out of your bank account and it doesn't reflect in your balance. Nice bonus. However, from that perspective, it uses the LDF file. But all of your data is going to be in this MDF file. So just to briefly go over the structure of this, the structure of that MDF file will have the notion of tables. Now, this is a horrible analogy, and I see it used everywhere else, but it's the old filing cabinet analogy. Your database is your filing cabinet, your tables are the individual drawers, and the data are those little folders in there recording information. So you might have a drawer about sales, you have a drawer about customers. So it's a very simplistic approach, but fundamentally that's probably one analogy you can use when understanding databases. But the core is this guy, tables. And your tables represent subject matter, subject domains within your organisation. So you might be recording a product list. And that's all within this table called products. But then you might say, well, I've got a list of products, but I need to describe them. How do I do that? Well, within products, we'll have fields. also known as attributes, so they describe the product. So we'll have, almost by default, there'll be something like a product ID. There might be a product, well, no might about it, you're going to have a product name, say, widget. It might have a colour. So if you non -Ameri for you Americans, I use you in colour. And, and various other attributes that describe it. Now, those products themselves, you sell them in your organisation. So you want to record the sales of those products. So we have a sales table. All right, that sales table will have fields such as a sale ID. So this is a unique key that's generated when a new sales record is written to that table. It, of course, will have a product ID because we want to know something about the product we're selling. 
The only thing that will record about the product in this instance is an ID because the description of the product is already happening in this table. We don't want to repeat the information in here. Now, in a data warehouse we might re repeat some information, that's called redundancy because that might assist with the performance of the data warehouse. But in a normal transaction system, we will have the notion of normalisation. So the design of our database uses what's commonly known as third form normalisation. So if you get a chance, get onto Google and, and search for database normalisation and it will discuss a little bit more around what goes on with normalisation. It's all about data modelling and designing your database, one, to be optimal from a performance point of view, and two, to ensure that we eliminate or at least substantially reduce repetitive data. For example, as I say, we don't want to store a whole bunch, we don't want the, uh, the product name or the, and the um, price and all other information that might be stored up here repeated in here. So we minimise the amount of information we're going to repeat. So that product ID for that sale is related through a join. So if you're doing a query, then you'll join on the product ID. Now in the just change colour of pens here, in the products table, this product ID will be known as a primary key, which, and it's automatically generated as a primary key. And in the sales table, because it's a related table, we have the foreign key. And I'll touch on this a little bit more as we move through, and I'll even demonstrate how to create these. But there will be times when you're just beyond grabbing data out of an online transaction system, in fact probably the enterprise won't let you do it, they'll let you have access to a data warehouse, a data mart, or an operational data store which may be a mirror of your enterprise database. But invariably as data analysts we're not really allowed to get onto a live ERP database because our queries can slow it down significantly. And that's another topic again, that's around database performance. So one takeaway from this, if you're doing a large query across a database table that's got millions of records in it and you're cross-joining it to another table that has millions of records in it, then you can end up with this massive Cartesian product which can just bog the whole system down performance-wise. So it's very important to understand what's going on with the database tables and the types of queries you're going to form. Again, I'll cover that as we move forward. So fundamentally we have tables that make up a database and that's where the bulk of your work will be from a SQL or SQL interaction point of view is concerned about forming joins across tables to get data out. And then once you've got that query happening then you can start to add value to it by introducing other functionality within those queries and that's what I'm teaching you here. So that's probably enough to cover the basics of what a database is. It's tables that are related through primary and foreign keys. We don't always need to do joins across keys, of course. They're, they're of course, the most performant, but we may actually need to use other attributes within the table to form joins. So it's not necessarily or obligatory to be just across keys. Alright, so what we'll do in the next lecture is we'll set up a number of lectures that break an SQL query down to its component parts so you understand the anatomy of a query. So I'll see you in the next lecture. Bye. Okay, welcome to chapter two. This is where we're going to explore the basics of SQL. The Opening lectures here will be really around the anatomy of a SQL query. This is what you really need to master in order to build your analysis on. The query structure itself is fairly straightforward. However, you can, depending on the data model underneath, build some very complex queries. And if you understand those building blocks, those components for a query, then it actually becomes quite easy and I want to just go through each component and demonstrate exactly how they work. So what we'll cover here over the next few lectures will be the components of a query. As you can see, we have a number of components listed here. These I consider to be the core of any query you're going to build. 
we have a select statement, so we're telling the database engine to select some data from a table, and in this case the something will be attributes within that table structure. So I could be doing a select on products, for example. The from is the specifier telling the engine what tables I want to gather data from. So I might be doing a select product name from the product table. And as you can see here, we can select on tables and views. We can select on combinations of tables and views, for example, depending on what our requirements are. And of course, when we do that, we'll be issuing a join statement here. So the join allows us to bring in multiple tables, multiple views to build up a row set to satisfy our particular data analysis requirement. We have a WHERE clause. So the WHERE, 99.9% .9 of the time you're going to use a WHERE clause because you'll want to specify some sort of filtration. So the WHERE clause is a predication to tell the engine exactly what conditions have to be met to retrieve the data from. So in, for example, if I'm doing a select sales from the sales table, the WHERE would be something in the order of WHERE sale date equals some particular date. So that's my predicate. Now, of course, it can get quite complex and we can build up from there. We have a group by. So if I'm doing a select where I'm introducing an aggregation into that select statement, such as, say, a sum or an average, min, max, etc., we have to tell the engine to group the data such that we're summarizing across a specific field. Now, it could be that we're selecting sales based upon a product category to summarize product category sales for a specific area of analysis we want to perform. We also have a having clause within the group by, so these two go hand in hand. The having is there for filtration within the group, and a good example of that, and I'll demonstrate this, is that we can use having for ex to establish duplicate data occurrences within a table. So that's just one example. So there's many, many different times you'll use the having clause. Then we have our sort ordering spec. So it's issued as an order by. So invariably you'll want to sort data in some specific way. The order by clause is where we do that. And we can sort on a field, so it'll be order by product. Or it might be on the ordinal number of a field. So in a, in a row, so just to demonstrate, so let's take that as a row. We have a number of fields, so that could be product, name, um, and so on, but they have an ordinal value. So that's field one, field two, and so on. So you could actually do a sort or an order by one. So we're telling the engine to sort on that first field. That's, you do that if you're in a hurry sometimes, but because you just don't want to type the field name, but I don't recommend using that as a permanent uh, sort or order by clause in your query set because if the field uh, actually disappears from that table it potentially is going to sort on a different field and that might return you know skewed results for you and last but not least you'll notice in the green here there's an apply we have outer and inner applies and we apply we use those whenever a join just won't do now of course to do all of this we're going to need some data so what i'll do once this intro lecture is over, I'm just going to take you through the process of downloading from Dropbox and restore the chapter backup database. And you'll go through that exercise. And of course, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to get in touch. But hopefully I'll step it out enough so it becomes very obvious what you have to do. And it'll be good for you to practice this because invariably you're going to do backups of databases to protect your work. OK, I'll see you in the next lecture. All right, let's get the .bak, this is a database backup file, down from the Chapter 2 share on Dropbox. 
I'll walk you through the steps and once we've downloaded we'll go into a restore function and demonstrate how to restore your chapter 2 sample data. Okay before we start playing with the files themselves let's just have a look at a couple of things that will make your job easier. First of all what I've done is created a folder structure on my C drive. I've called it SQL the Hitchhiker's Guide. If you'd like to do the same thing I'd recommend it because it'll just make life a whole lot easier for the downloads. So I've created the three chapters that we're going to have download data for and of course scripts and you can see chapter 2, 3 and 4. So let me walk you through another tip and then we'll get into the Dropbox area to populate these particular folders. So the other tip I have is if you, depending on your browser, I'm using Chrome, if I actually go into the settings, Chrome has a default download folder. So I'll just scroll down to it and as you can see I've set my download location to SQL the Hitchhiker's Guide. That's the root folder. So anything I download from Dropbox will go into that folder area automatically. So this makes life a whole lot easier in terms of not having to chase around where your files have gone. So I'd recommend you do that. You should be able to do that in Edge or IE, Firefox and so on depending on the browser you use. So of course these are only recommendations. You don't have to do this but this just makes the job easier overall. So let's get back into our video. I'm just going to get out of there. And what you'll notice when you're watching a video and you hover over the video, if there are resources available, Udemy tells you this. It highlights a little resources available button. To get to those resources, just click on it. And as you can see, there are two links for this chapter. So I have a database link and I have a scripts and data types list link here. So let's look at the, first, uh, the chapter scripts first. These are the scripts that you'll use to experiment, if you will, or follow through these particular lectures that are going to be presented. As you can see, there are a number, of a number of files available. You can't actually modify these files on Dropbox. Let's just click one and see it open. This is a very simple one, but if I try and do anything, as you can see, nothing's happening. Okay, which is good because this is protecting. This is the security level. <laughs> All right, so there's a number of files here. There's also a list of SQL data types. Now to download these is very straightforward. If you click up here on the download button, you'll see a download as zip. So this is where our predefined folders come in very handy. So let's click download. Down, because this is Chrome, down on the left hand side here, left hand corner, there's a scripts.zip. Now I'm just going to do a show in folder to demonstrate what's happening here. So there it is. It's downloaded it to the SQL Hitchhiker's Guide. So I'm just going to move it into the Chapter 2 because that's what we're currently looking at is Chapter 2. And I'm just going to unpack it. All right. So I just click on it and extract all except the default folder it's offering. And now we have our chapter 2 data and scripts and there's the scripts that were used during the course and I'll point you to where you need to open these during the course process. Okay so I'm just going to clean it up I'm just actually going to delete that because I've got the scripts I need. Now let's go and get our database. I'm just going to drop out of there. Let's click the database and you'll see it pop up on the screen for you. Let's refresh the screen. Chapter 2 sales BAK. SQL Server backup files are always extended with a .bak so you can't miss them. You always know what sort of file it is. Download is pretty much the same. Just click the download. Okay, that download is now complete. So what we can do here is do a show in folder and there's our Chapter 2 sales back. Let's just move it into the Chapter 2 area. And now we have everything we need ready for this set of lectures but first we do need to restore this database into the management environment so I'm just going to walk you through that process now. To restore your database is very straightforward just open up your SQL Server Management Studio and it should prompt you for a database or SQL Server instance to connect to. This is the server name, mine's Tim Tam, my favourite biscuit, not that I eat many 
full of sugar. The thing to do now is just connect. And what you should see, if you click on the databases, you should see a single folder for system databases. There should be nothing else there. Whatever you do, don't tinker in here because you can break SQL Server unless you really know what you're doing. But we don't need to worry about that for this course. To do the restore, if you click on the databases folder, right mouse click and do a restore. And what it's going to do is come through, it's a wizard, it'll just follow some questions and answers for you to fill out. It's very straightforward. So follow me through here, you won't, it, it's not difficult. Click device, click the ellipsis on the right hand side. What that's going to do now is ask you for a file. We're going to actually point eventually when it comes back. Mine's a bit slow today. Okay, normally when you do a restore, it's going to ask for the Microsoft SQL Server backup directory. We're not worried about that here. We're going to use that one we set up earlier, which was the Hitchhiker's Guide. You remember chapter two, and there it sees our database. So we just simply click OK after selecting it. Click OK again, and there's our backup information. Now, if you already have a backup file restored, which I do because I was testing this out prior to running this, uh, this particular lecture, we need to overwrite it. You don't have to worry about this, but I'm just clicking overwrite. So if you do have a database there already and you're restoring to it because something's changed or you've had some issue or you've detached the database, then just click the overwrite. If you don't do that, it'll give you an error to say that the database already exists. So that's all I have to do. I'm just going to go back to general, double check everything. Looks good. And click OK. And it's come back to say that the restore has completed. And there's our database. And there's all of our tables. So that's as far as we need to go for this lecture. We've restored the database that we need. And I'll see you in the next lecture. And we'll start working through the content, foundation skills. See you there. G'day, you came back. All right, here we go for this lecture. We're going to look at the SELECT statement. The SELECT statement is the first statement you'll issue in your SQL query. It's pivotal to everything you do. All right, so let's get into Management Studio and start exploring. Okay, so let's open the Management Studio. So just hop into there, please and connect to your default database, assuming you haven't already left it open, which I didn't. And you may recall we have our restored database here, which is Chapter 2 Sales. Now I just want to run through a few key points for moving forward. To query a database, we will work within the context of a query window. To create the window, we need to use the new query button. So if you click on there, you'll see now it will open up a type of text editor. The tab is actually a file. So anything you write in here, you can save as a file. By default, the Management Studio creates these SQL query 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. So it's actually creating query files for you. It's numbering them sequentially. And of course, as you work, you'll find these will get quite high in number. Now to save the file, what I'm going to do here is if I click the Save Query, that's the single Save button here, not that one. That one basically saves everything and you might not want to actually achieve that, but practice with that anyway. Explore. The Save Query will automatically open the SQL Server Management Studio file folder where you can save some of your work. I tend to use the code snippets. So if I double click there, there's two folders, XML and SQL. Open the XML, click on My Code Snippets, and create yourself a new folder. So in this case, I'm going to use Chapter 2 Code and Scripts, for example. You can name it anything you like, just to keep your code organized for your course. I'll just enter the uh, folder and I'm just going to call this demo select and there it is it's saved. Now if I exit that window now and click control so it's keyboard control and O it'll take me down to where I want to go 
and there's the file open it and of course now you don't need any text in there of course you can stay, save it as an empty file all right the other thing to remember is as well that when you first come into the database of the uh, SQL Server Management Studio very often you'll see that all right if you try to issue a query it won't know where to execute the query against it'll by default try and execute it against the master database I recommend you click the drop down and select the chapter database you plan to use in this case we're doing chapter 2 now there are some default selects that are on offer here as well so what I can show you is for example if I want to have a look at all of the customers I can do a right mouse click and select top 1000 all right so this is a predicate in itself I'm saying get the top 1000 customers from this table now you notice here in the from clause it's put a what we call a fully qualified reference to the database table or the database and table now you'll notice up here it's completely ignored the context we selected before all right now as a rule we tend not to if we're in a hurry and just want to do a quick select then that's one way to do it and of course this top 1000 is a bit of a protection because if that customer table was a million rows well you don't want to sit there and wait for a million rows to display and you probably have a DBA uh, on your back complaining to you that your queries are taking too long so that's a quick way of getting data through a select clause so we'll just hop out you can actually get rid of that you notice if we got rid of the top 1000 and I'll be demonstrating this a little bit more later on in terms of scoping your query so if I execute that again now we can see we have 18,400 rows so we got all of the rows out so I'm just going to get out of there I don't want to save that one now we can use select in a singular form so if I do a select and no, nothing there in other words I'm not referencing any data I can actually just return a value through some constant coding so in this case I'm going to make a constant select one two three as test field because what I'm doing here is returning the value one two three in a field called test field now I don't need that if I don't want it so let's just demonstrate it if you highlight what you want to execute then and click F5 here we go we've got one two three and no column name if I don't highlight it and just take the whole line it's assigned test field as a column name to the value I've returned now that in itself doesn't have a lot of relevance in terms of what we want to display to a user or ourselves but we can use it in other ways so if I for example add one two three to that what we have here is a fairly convoluted calculator and if I do a divide by two now see if you can guess what's going to happen that doesn't look right does it now I just want to emphasize order of precedence when and if you remember your schoolboy schoolgirl math you'll notice that in math we actually have order of preference uh, precedence so in this case I'm telling SQL to perform that part of the calculation first and then divide it by 2 so what we should see as a result is 123 and if we run it there's the result 123 so I bring that up now because I'm sowing the seeds of rules in your mind so remember order of precedence is important now when I create a select query and as of course select is the only way you're going to get data out of your tables during this course I pre-construct my query now there goes the IntelliSense you notice it's bringing back some other functions so we'll find that you'll be receiving all sorts of suggestions from IntelliSense as you move along now what I'm going to do is I've decided in my mind I want to return data from customer so I'm going to drag customer over now if I actually start to type in a column for example 
and I know that customer keys there, I do cust, it will actually start to make suggestions and there is customer key. Now I can click that if I like, that's one way, or I can drag it along. Now something to remember, if I execute this now, you notice that it's only displayed customer key once. Now what we can do if we put a column, uh, a delimiter there, a comma delimiter, what do you think will happen? Let's see. Now we can see both fields. Again, sowing the seed of an idea. Just bear this in mind because this can play an important part later on. Now if I want to rename a field, I can just do an as customer field excuse my terrible typing field 2 and run it and even though they're the same value I've got different field names now we'll utilize those quite extensively during our data analysis all right the other thing to quickly show you is you can use wildcards wildcards basically tell the engine to get everything from that table select star gives you all of the fields so select in itself is very very simple it's easy to use it is the tenet behind all of your queries you will 99 percent of the time have to do some sort of select now you might start exploring sql a bit further later on down the track and start working with curses where you're doing fetch but me personally i steer away from curses because they are resource intensive they're not an efficient way to retrieve data but if you want to go and research it feel free in data analysis i very rarely have to use it all right so i think we're going to run into almost 10 minutes or beyond and i want to try and keep these lectures to at least 10 minutes otherwise we're just going to get a little bit probably overwhelmed now i'm just going to save this query because i'm going to use it in the next lecture which will be about predicates in other words, the WHERE clause. We're going to work out a way to extract data based upon some query, what's the word I'm looking for? Constraint, filter, predicate, or so on. All right, so if I just do a quick save there, it's resaved it, and in the next lecture, we'll start expanding upon this. So I'll see you there. It's very unlikely that you'll go through SQL life without having to build some sort of predication into your query. And this is where the, excuse the pun, WHERE clause comes into play. There is a lot of power in the WHERE clause. This is your filtration mechanism. There's a lot of functionality in there that will make your life a whole lot easier when filtering data. So I'll see you in there. Okay, now let's explore the where clause the where clause is what you will use to influence the data that is returned from your query this clause is very easy to write we are just going to add the verb or the clause there where and we have to specify some filtration so in this instance i want to do a simple equality so i'm going to test a field's value I'm interested in the gender, for example, so I'm going to drag the gender field across. And my equality is basically using the equals operator, and I'm going to say F for female. Now, just ignore the uh, IntelliSense here. It's very zealous, as you can see. The gender F for female, you'll notice it has a little curly thing under it. Well, basically it's saying it's an invalid column name. It thinks I'm referencing a column somewhere. So if I run that, you can see error. This is because anytime you're using a string value in a where predicate, you will need to wrap it up in quotes. So if I run that now, it's returned all of the female customers. Now while we're at it, I want to save this query because I'm going to Put it up on Dropbox at the end of this section for you to download. So what we do is if you move over to the left hand side of your management studio and click on file and then you'll see here save demo select as. So I'm just going to click that and what we will call it, now don't worry about the this specifier here, it's just 
the way the file handler works. I'm going to call this where, demo select where, and I will save that. And just quickly, we'll make sure we got it right. Let's do a control O, and there's the file. All right, now let's add another one. What we'll do here now is we'll search for some rows that contain a value as part of a string. So I'm just going to split it up using a comment line. So you notice with comments, you can use dashes that specifies a comment. Or you can actually use forward slash asterisk and asterisk forward slash. And that gives you a comment block. So you can write, and invariably you'll do this, you'll be building queries for analysis. You'll want to write some comments because if you're like me, you'll probably forget why you wrote that particular piece of code three weeks later. All right, so now I'm going to just copy and paste this one. And what I'm going to do here, so I'll quickly run that again so I've got some data to work with. And I want to look for, let's see, what do we have? I'm going to look for professionals. So what I'm going to say here is I'm going to use the like statement. So I'm saying get me all of the occupations. Notice how the IntelliSense has picked it for me. Get me all of the occupations that are like. And I'm going to use a pattern of percent. So we're using the percent mask. And I'm going to say prof. And we'll see what that turns up. So we're doing a select from customer where occupation is like prof. And here we go. We have a number of customers, about 5,000 customers with a professional based occupation. OK, that's very easy. I'm just going to change this. What I'll do is I'll pause the video and I'll put a comment line explaining each one of these as we move on. OK, so what we'll do now is we'll build a search based on, if I could type, search based on a comparison operator. This is, again, very simple to do. And it is basically going to return a value. What I'm interested in are where the total children are greater than two. So how many customers do I have with a large family? So let's drag or type total. And there's total children. Tab that out. And I'm going to go for greater than or equals. All right. So I want anyone that has four or more children. So I'll run that. Don't forget to just select what you want to run. You can run the whole lot in one hit, but it might get a little messy. All right, I have 3,000 customers with large families, which is great. I have four children of my own. All right, so that's a comparison operator. We're using greater than or equals. All right, we can use less than or equals. All right, we can use, now the not equals can be this. Or I prefer to use the splat or exclamation and not equals in that way. So that's just a set of examples for operators, comparison operators. I recommend you do some reading on that. It might reveal some more insight for you. Now my next one will be, I think what we might do is let's build more than one comparison or one, more than one condition in here. So basically I'm looking to include an OR construct. All right, so what we'll do is we'll just copy and paste that little bit to save a bit of typing and we'll just paste that in there. So what I'm going to do here is let's say the first, I'm going to look for customers that have a large family and I'm interested in other Things. So I'm going to issue an OR. And what I will do now is add another. So let's say we have a yearly income. We use another operator. OK, yearly income of less than or equal to, let's say, 60000 All right, so $60,000. And you notice I don't have to wrap anything in quotes here because these are numbers that I'm testing. So SQL doesn't try to interpret those as field names. 
Now the next one, let's have a guess. Let's see where, just better put the OR in there. So the OR, these are all valid constructs. Let's see, education level. Let's see if they own a house. Let's say house owner. So let's go back to our query. House owner flag equal to one. All right. Now let's have a quick look to see if that house owner, that's a character that, all right, I'm going to cover data types for you in another lecture soon, but the house owner flag is a character. So we have to wrap that up in quotes because it's a string. And then I will select. And now we've returned a number of rows that satisfy our criteria. So in our next one, we're going to stipulate that the predicate, in other words, the row set must meet three conditions. So again, let's just copy and paste. And what we want to do now is, let's say we want total children. So we want a big family again. But now we're going to explicitly issue an AND, all right? So I'm going to tell it that I want, in addition to that criteria, I want to ensure that the yearly income, so we're going to run with that, and I also want to ensure they're a house owner. So the AND is where we're setting very specific conditions to match. So in other words, these, these three conditions must match. So let's run that and see what we get. All right, it returned 929 rows. So what we can see here is that we've reduced our row set considerably based upon a very specific demographic. So what we're saying here is from an analytical point of view is potentially we have large families on a possibly low to middle income, depending on where you live, and but they own their own home. Now I wonder if there's any that don't own their own home. So it's 929 rows, so just take note of that. What will it be if significantly less? Actually, it's 328 rows. So we can see that we're starting to form the basis of some analytics here. Now, of course, we don't want to be looking down at the bottom of the screen here every time we want to find counts. I'll take you through basic aggregations in another section. So we're running at 10 minutes or so. I think what we'll do is just, oh, look, I'm gonna run, I just have one more I want to show you, and that's range checking. So what we can do here, so SQL supports the notion of testing data between a specific start and end value. So let's just recopy that query. And what I'm going to do here is select the yearly income that satisfies a specific range. So just make some space. So if I type in yearly income and I'm going to use the keyword between. All right, so I'm telling the query now to find the yearly income between, I'm going to run with 40,000 and all right, so the syntax is between a start and end. So the end value here will be say 80,000. And we'll just select it and run. And we have about 10,000 people with a range of value in their yearly income. All right, so that's just another way of doing some checking and selection filtering of your data. All of these scripts I will save in the snippets and I will upload them to Dropbox for you to download and play with. So in fact, by the time you get to downloading your course data, this will all be there anyway. Okay, so everything you see done here is replicated for your use. Now, I'd recommend perhaps you have a play with this. I'll set some assignments at the end of the section for you to run. And those assignments will basically be just questions to, and I'll know the answers and we'll go from there. All right, so I'll see you in the next section, or I should say the next lecture. We're running over time now. And what I'll demonstrate there is how to use the group by clause. And I'll see you there.
Okay, so in this lecture, lecture number nine, we're going to look at group by. Now we use group by whenever we're creating queries that have aggregation in there, such as sum or count, average and so on. So basically what's happening with a group by, it's taking your selected set of records that you've built in the query and then it results in a summary set based upon, the grouping is based upon the columns that you've selected in that query. So I'm going to walk you through using this and I'll see you in the Management Studio in two ticks. Okay, you need to be back into your Microsoft SQL Server Management Studio if you're not already there. If you are there and you still have this file displayed, just close it and we'll create a new one and we'll quickly save that. Always be quick to save your work. We'll call this demo select group by. Now what we're going to do here is we've had an approach from some people within the marketing department and they're for a marketing campaign they're interested in understanding the income versus the education level by gender across their customer base. So let's start working with the group by to answer this question. Now this is almost the first entry point into your analytics capability. So anytime you're going to do an aggregation, you'll need to use the group by clause. Okay, and as just to recap, the group by is building a summary of your selected row set across the selected columns. In other words, the fields you select in the query, you're going to group across those to provide that summary information. So the first thing we're going to do is start building up our query. So remember, we always go and build the basic tenant. So we want to build from customer in this case, and we'll select star. If I run that, I'm naturally not going to show the marketing people because they won't get any insight from this. Now, the next step is to actually isolate the fields we're interested in. So the fields interested in. And what we shall do is, again, we'll copy and paste. And just remember this moving forward, your queries, build them up piece by piece. You can never tackle a complete problem in one big hit. Everything can be broken down to, into its component parts. And as we get more into the advanced component of this course, you'll see how we break things down into component parts of the problem in order to answer the question that's been thrown at us. Once you get your mindset into that, then this becomes a very easy process. And, and that's pretty much like anything in life. You break a problem down into its component parts and address each part individually. And you know what they say, the sum of the parts equals the whole. All right, so I'm interested in the yearly income. So I'm just gonna grab the yearly income. Where is it? We'll find it there. And the, what else am I interested in? So I want to grab the education level. So we have an, there it is, education level. So let's just drag that across. I should just get in the habit of typing. Somehow I do things a little slower when I'm presenting. The education level, now I'm interested in the gender. So I have the three basic attributes to answer the question. So that's part one of the problem solved. The next one is I want to work out some sort of aggregation. So what I'm going to do is use the average. All right, so I'm looking at the average income. So let's break that down further. Now what we can do when we, the thing to remember is when we're building aggregations, we do have to use the group by clause, but I'll demonstrate what happens if you get this wrong. Now, if I just run that, it's not going to give me anything because I haven't set up a group by at this point. So the group by is just syntactically very easy. It's just group by. So I'm just telling the engine, SQL engine, what columns or attributes fields I want to group by. So in this case, I'm grouping by the education level and gender. There we have it. So let's have a look at what turns up. Aha, all right, we now have all the salaries and look, no column name. What happens? When you use aggregations in a 
SQL query, the name of the field is abstracted out. So basically nothing occurs there. Now that's a bit misleading, so I'm not going to be able to understand what that field is. Sure, in an easy, simple query like this, we will. But in complex queries, that can easily be mistaken for something else. So always ensure you've got your as yearly income specifier there. All right, and we'll just run that again. Ba boom. But I'm interested in sorting. So as we can see here, it's all over the place. So let's order. So this is where you can build your sorting. And for ordering or ranking, simple ranking, sorting, use the order by clause. That's this here. Now, you have to specify what field you want to use or the ordinal position. Let's use the yearly income and run that. And the default sort order is always ascending. So we're going from the lowest to the highest. I'm interested in seeing the highest to the lowest because that's what the campaign is about for marketing is to establish the higher order of salary here because very likely the, the actual campaign might target this particular income demographic. All right, now let's see. I'm interested in understanding the average of the group. So to calculate that is very easy. Let's look at the group by with an extra function. So I'm going to calculate the average over the group. And I can type. All right, so again, we just simply, I'm not worried about the, the sort at this point, so I'm just going to select that, post it into there. And what I plan to do is use a new function known as rollup. Or when I say new function, I'm introducing a new function to the group by here. Now it's simply group by, then rollup. Now we all understand rollup. In other words, we're aggregating over the levels of columns. So what I need to do is include in brackets these two fields. This is what I'm rolling up. So your roll up will match your group by. So you notice up here we're group by education level and gender. The roll up requires the same fields. In other words, wherever you're doing a group by, you need to include these in your roll up. Let's just run that and see what happens. Now we can see the average of the female and male bachelor's degree income is this. All right, so that gives you a bit more visual for the marketing department in terms of what the average is across these groups. But it still doesn't look that great, does it? So what we can do here is visualize. So I'm going to go back to my marketing department with a visual. And what I've done is taken that data and loaded it into ClickSense. Now, if you want to learn ClickSense, you can download it from click.com. And it's actually free of charge to download and develop in. You don't have to pay for the desktop version ever. So you can do, you can, if you like, you could replace Excel and use ClickSense desktop. Going one step further, and I won't do any more promos during this course, I also have a ClickSense app development course. Now get in touch with me if you want a coupon, because I'll bundle this. Now the pricing is set to the new Udemy standard, so just let me know. I will post coupons at some point. At the moment, the, as I write this course, the new pricing hasn't taken place. All right, that's all, that's all I'm gonna do in terms of self-promotion. Now, as you can see, Demographically, we can note that depending on your education level, and this is almost a no-brainer, your income is decreasing. So we can see there's very little difference between the male and females across this demographic. So the diamond here is the female income and the little yellow line is the male income. And But you can see that the education, it's a really large step down from graduate degree to partial high school. All right, so we can get an idea. Now what, what's gonna happen here is of course the marketing department are gonna be very interested in these two. Now if I want to actually just filter those two, I can lasso, all right, so I'm just lassoing those. 
don't have to be a great drawer. Click tick. And now we can see our graduate degree and bachelor's. So that took about 10 minutes to write that. I just loaded the data using the query, slightly modified query here. I don't do the group by in the, um, the SQL, of course. I just select the raw data and I'll quickly show you that. It's very, very straightforward. I made a connection to my local free SQL server software. As you can see, I did a connect to TimTam and I'm loading a new table called Income Education. But in this case, I'm not doing any grouping. I'm just ordering the data and selecting yearly income, gender and education level because I've done everything within the, within the actual screen itself, within the sheet, I should say. Okay, so it's very, very easy to build visualizations using ClickSense. That would have taken me a little, little bit longer in Excel perhaps, um, but I'm not a big fan of Excel for this type of visualization. All right, so that's all there is to it in that one. Now, if you want to filter, of course, you just click in ClickSense and we can see you've got graduate degree. Now, to do the same thing, I can use just introducing the having clause. Whenever you're doing a filter within a group, you use the having clause, okay? So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say having education level equal to, let's see, because it's a string I'm going to test, I need to wrap it up in apostrophes, and let's have a look at graduate degree. And as we can see there, it's just simply a case of running that query. Now we've changed it to have a having. F5, and there's our value. Now, how does that compare visually? So we saw that the average was for male 66,711, and there's 66,711 there. So this is probably a good time to end this lecture. I've run into nearly 12 minutes. Hopefully you to me don't come back to me on presentation and say split it. So I'll see you in the next lecture. In the next lecture, we're going to cover data types. It's worth getting to know data types. Okay, see you there. Okay, this is our very last lecture for this section. What I just want to briefly go through is just spend a few minutes with you discussing some of the data types you'll be encountering within your SQL tables. Now, this can be a long and boring subject, so I'm not going to actually spend too much time. I'm just going to quickly show you the data types within the customers table, for example, and then you can feel free to go off and do some more research about data types. It's fairly straightforward. Uh, in, in addition, I'm going to just show you how to convert data types using the cast function. OK, I'll see you in the management studio. Here we are back in the management studio. Just a very quick overview of data types. Fundamentally, data types are about understanding what type of data you will store in a field. So for example, if I'm storing money, in other words, the income of a customer, then I'm going to use the data type money. So let's just have a quick look in the customer. So if you right mouse click over the customer and click design, what happens is a window will open up showing all of the fields and their data types and another feature here, allow nulls. Now, what we're doing, this is a constraint, we'll cover this later. So the data type is telling us what data, what content will be stored and how it will be stored within the customer table. Now this applies to any table you create. So it's very important to think about the data you're using and design accordingly. So for example, our customer key uses an integer value. So let's quickly select the top 10,000 rows and you can see we have a number here. All right, so the number is an integer. In other words, it's not anything other than a whole number. It can hold a relatively high value. Now, off the top of my head, I don't remember the range, but you can do a help in SQL and it'll give you the negative to positive ranging for an integer. It's pretty high, so you can get away with quite a lot of numbers in here. The customer alternate key uses varchar. Now what it means by varchar, it's a variable value. So SQL, when it stores the value of varchar, it won't pre-allocate the space 
which in this case was saying a value of up to 50 characters long. It won't pre-allocate it on the database page. Now we're getting into the realms of database design and some very low level information, but it's, as analysts we're not really overly interested in that. Just suffice you to say that varchar means if we only have 10 characters for that field value, that's all that will be allocated on the database page is a value of 10. Now it'll take up to 50. If we exceed that 50 you'll get something like a truncate error when you insert values that are greater than that field can cope with. And of course it will let you carry on with the truncation, so be careful there. Now these are probably all overkill, it would appear that no pre-analysis has been done so it's unlikely somebody has a title that's 50 characters long. Now when you actually create a field you'll see you have a drop down box so there's quite a number of different data types you can get into. So for example binary, so you can store a binary value up to 50, uh, 50 elements long. Similarly we can find var binary max and anywhere where you see this max it will allow you to store a value that is very very large okay now depending on the type of data then that max will have some sort of upper limit again research that it's not a major consideration of course very often you'll stick video or some sort of visual graphics in that field now varkar max same sort of thing very big uh, very big value and naturally you can store XML within fields as well. Now that's a whole different topic. We're not worried about that at the moment as analysts for this course anyway. We have various date time options. So this is small date and time. And then we have normal date and date time. So we have quite a lot of variable, variability to the type of data we can store. Uh, money is another one that's commonly used for things like income values or sales values and so on. The, you'll notice here we have n varchar, so it's the same as a varchar except the underlying data will be represented via 16 bits as opposed to 7 bits. The reason we use n varchar is if we're storing Japanese or Chinese symbols, Greek symbols, Cyrillic and so on. So this gives you the ability to contain that type of data within your database. So as you can see there's quite a number of different options available for you for storing your data. Now it is important to note that if you're storing keys for example integer is very efficient from a database storage and indexing point of view. And that's another topic that gets around performance which we'll cover briefly in this course because we have to understand the constraints of our query. A large query across a large table, especially if it's returning a Cartesian product, can really belt the server performance overall. In terms of other data types, for example, if we have a value that's contained within a field that is let me find one, I think we have one here, house owner flag for example we know has a 0 or 1 in it but it's contained within a char value, char data type, what we need to be able to do is convert that to a number at some point. So when we're converting data we can actually use the cast function. Let's have a quick look at that. So we'll just create a new query here and if we do a select what I'm going to do here is select that house owner flag. All right, so we can see the house owner flag is stored as a char 10, which is overkill in this instance, bad design in my books, but it's a 0 or 1. If I wanted to sum this together, all right, let's see what would happen. All right, so what it's saying is here, we cannot do a sum over a data type of char or anything that's not a number in other words. Okay, so it's given me an error. But I can sum it if I convert the number. Alright, so there are two ways to convert the number. You can use the convert function or cast. Now a bit of bad habit on my part, I use cast which is a standard. And if we do cast expression, so the expression is the house owner flag and I'm going to cast it as 
I can use another data type. I can select any of the legal data types that are available within SQL Server. In this case, I'm going to use integer. This should have been stored as an integer in the first place. And as you can see, it gives you an option set. And I have to, just to make it nice and neat and tidy, you'll notice that I'm embedding the function within another function. So I'm doing a sum of cast. Now, you remember I mentioned order of precedence before in a previous lecture? The same applies here. Anywhere we're using functions, we're looking at executing from the inside out. So the first thing that will happen is the house owner flag will be cast as an integer. Then the sum will be applied over it. And there you can see. So we have 12,502 as the sum of house owner flag. Right, so this is very, very handy because I've come across databases in my work history where DBAs, database designers, have got it wrong and they've put numbers inside of strings. So I need to convert it. Now this can be a bit messy because if there are actually strings within those fields, then we have all sorts of other nasties happening. And believe me, as a data analyst, you will spend a lot of time cleansing data. You'll extract and cleanse data before you can get it to a point where you actually want to use it for analytics. And that becomes, well, quite time and labor intensive, but you'll discover that as you move on with your, your work, if you haven't already discovered it now. All right, so that's a simple cast. So let's end the lecture there. I've rabbited on a bit about this. It's very straightforward. All you have to remember is make sure you pick the field types that you need for your, your particular um, content. Now I can hear a horrible noise in the background, so I apologize for that. Clearly gardeners are running around doing some work. Now, the next lecture set will be in chapter three, and I'm going to really get into the detail of relationships. No, I'm not talking about human relationships. I'm talking about what we're going to do with joins. So I'll see you in the next lecture set, which is chapter three. Welcome to chapter three. In this chapter, we're going to learn about all of the different types of join that we can perform when we're trying to extract and analyze data that spans many tables. The first port of call, though, is we need to download the chapter three database. And this lecture is just about stepping through the download from Dropbox and a restore of the database. Just to recap, I'll see you in there. All right, to get our files for this lecture series, we just hover over our video player on our browser and as always the resources available button will appear. All you have to do is click on that as we've seen before and there's a chapter database and chapter scripts. We'll look at the chapter scripts first of all. Just click on that. It'll take you to Dropbox and here's our files. There are five files for download for you to play with. And to download, we just simply click the download button, download a zip, and there we have it down on the left hand side of the screen here. Let's just show in folder, and it should be in your Hitchhiker's Guide root folder if you set this up. Just move it up to chapter three, open up the folder, and we'll just unpack or extract all, accept the default extract and there's the files you need for this lecture series. I'm just going to delete that because I'm a clean freak and everything's ready to rock and roll. So now let's go and look at our database. I'm just going to hop out of there. So here's our chapter three sales. This is a keyed version. What this means is now there is a model that reflects foreign and primary key constraints within the database and I'll be giving you some insight into that during this chapter's lectures. So let's just do a download and restore. All right, as we can see, it's downloaded. Let's just click on show in folder and we'll just move it to our chapter three data and scripts. And we'll just get into our management studio and we'll do a restore. So as you call, you just right mouse click on the databases folder and do a restore database and we'll just go out to our device again click on the ellipsis accept file 
click add and of course we don't need the Microsoft SQL Server. In a real life scenario we would be working in perhaps that folder or indeed other folders that's more DBA related for our course we're not so worried. Chapter 3 in scripts there's our database click OK and I'm just going to select the overwrite just in case I have one there previously. Again use caution here just in case you've made changes that you do want to keep. Click OK. It only takes a few seconds. Click OK again and there's our database. And as we can see we have the same tables as the Chapter 2 database. But the difference is here we now have a data model. I'm just going to open that up for you for a quick look. Now we can maintain visuals for data models within the SQL Server product. Of course, that's a very minimum requirement. If you don't have something like a decent data modeling tool, such as Visio or System Architect or Embarcadero and a number of other products that are available out there. So very often I could be on site and there's nothing available. So I'll do the modeling within SQL Server. And of course, if you want to move around it, you just have to do that and that's it. But I'll show you more of this as we move forward into the course. So let's get into the lectures and carry on with this chapter three section. See you in there. Okay, for this lecture, we are going to explore the chapter three database. What has changed in there is that we now have primary and foreign key constraints defined. What this reveals is a model within the database itself and you will be able to understand the relationships between the tables as a result of these keys. Now, the majority of databases in SQL, Oracle and so on that you encounter in your career will most likely have some sort of primary foreign key relationship build as well as other key and constraints within the table structures themselves. This does not guarantee always that the data you try to import or analyze is of a good quality structure. But for learning the join, then this structure gives you more of a documented clue as to how things are related to each other. All right, so join me in the management studio and we'll just have a quick look at the database layout before we move into forming relationships. See you there. All right, here we are in the management studio. As you notice, we have chapter three, sales, keyed, restored. The table structures are the same as what's in chapter two, but in this case, I've created relationships between the tables. So let's open our favorite one. We've been dealing with customer up to now, so we'll use this as the culprit for the lecture. And if I click on the keys, we can see we have a PK customer and an FK customer geography. Now the primary key itself is the way that we identify a unique value within the customer table. All right, so if I quickly select, we can see that the customer key is thus. In the majority of cases, we should not see duplicates in here because the constraint will be such that it's a primary key and that won't be allowed. Now, in theory, the source system that populates this table should prevent that happening as well, but you never know. Now, the foreign key is stating that we have a geography value. So let's have a look at geography key is also within the geography table. So we'll just open that up and there's the geography key. Now in the geography table, geography key is a primary key. So what we could liken this to is a relational key. In other words, this is how we form the relationship between the two tables. So we have a customer with a relationship to the geography table because that customer lives somewhere in a city, state, country, etc. So what we can do here is visualize this very easily. If I, now, I'm not trying to attempt to do a data modeling course here, so just 
all I'm trying to communicate is that we relate our tables through the mechanism of primary and foreign keys. Now, if I go into the database diagrams where I've created a visual of the model, I'll just open that up. As you can see, we have all of the tables that reside in the database. And these primary foreign key constraints define the linkages. So for example, let's find our customer and geography. So in theory, that is now, if this is a big model, of course, if you write, come down to the right hand corner of the screen and click, you'll get a little schema. Okay, so it's like a 10,000 foot view of your database. So here I've located customer and geography. As we can see, the connection or the relationship between customer and geography is the geography key there. All right, now you won't see an icon next to it for the foreign key. You'll just have to rely on the connection information. So this is metadata that we're seeing displayed about the actual relationship between the two. So that's denoting the foreign key, which is customer, geography key, and then the primary key table is the one with the little gold key. All right, so the relationships are very easy to form. I'm just going to come out of here. Now please feel free to explore this diagram because it'll give you an indication of all of the relationships. And when I actually teach you the joins, then you'll be able to say, OK, well, I think the join is based upon this relationship. In other words, we know what tables relate to what. Because a join could be made in your query that's actually not logical. All right? It does not necessarily require like naming across the joins. And I'll demonstrate that. OK, so it's very easy to mess things up. Now, let's just come out of the diagram. And I was going to show you how to create a relationship. So if we actually edit, so we've been into the design before. Now to make a, a, an actual primary key, you see that, let's just remove it. All right, so the primary key is gone and it would have broken the link in the data model diagram. So I'm just going to put it back. So all you have to do is do a set primary key. Now. Just as an aside, compound keys, compound uh, composite keys are multi-field keys. So potentially, I could select those three keys, right mouse, and make those fields a part of a primary key. Now there will be times when you want to do this. Okay, so let's just remove the primary key and put the customer one back. Oops. OK, so that primary key, you'll notice here, does not allow nulls. So we cannot have a null primary key. In fact, any key you define, you should ensure that it cannot contain nulls. So that just builds a constraint in its own right. Now, if I'm creating a relationship, so we have a relationships component in our editor. And what we can see here, it automatically names it FK Customer Geography. And what we're going to see are the tables. So if I hit the ellipsis button, we can see our primary key table is geography, because that's where the primary key resides. And our foreign key table, in this case, our customer, has a geography key resident within it as well. So let's just open that up. Bear with me here. And there's the geography key value. And you'll notice it has a gray key next to it. So it's indicating that it has a foreign key relationship to another table. And indeed, to understand those relationships, it's just a matter of going into design mode and clicking relationships. And you can see what the table relationship is. Very, very straightforward. Now, of course, it can get more complex than this, but again, we're not in here to do data modeling per se. We have a database structure to be working with. And 
The fact we have primary foreign key relationships means you can determine what relates to what. In other words, is it logical to have the product related to the geography? Clearly not, because the product doesn't reside anywhere. We're not, in this instance, we're not building an inventory with a product location. We just have a list of products and it has a product subcategory. And from there, we can determine the category and subcategorization of products. And we'll be doing some analysis around those as we move further into the course. So that was a very quick overview. I don't think I've ever explained data modeling in less than 10 minutes before, but fundamentally, it's all about understanding the relationships across your data because you don't want to form unnatural relationships per se. All right, so that's all there is to it with the database. We'll just go back in there again. And as you can see, the best thing to do is just explore and you can see what is related to what. I'm a visual person and it's much nicer to see things visually rather than tinkering around in here. Of course, you can do so if you choose, but from a visual point of view, everything is set. Alright, there's also some other options in here. You can even click relationships at this level and see what relationships are in that calendar table. Alright, so we've got a number. We've got three distinct date relationships. We also have a inventory relationship as well, which is getting back to the inventory Let's just have a quick look there and there's the product inventory so that gives us a clue as to how much stock we have online all right so you can derive quite a lot of information about the relationships through primary and foreign keys now of course if they didn't exist such as up here so we don't have one so we don't have anything there it'd be very hard now this is relatively easy because we have naming conventions that support reverse engineering at a fairly fairly easy level but I've been around long enough to see a lot of databases don't have these nice naming conventions and I was working on a SAP data migration some years ago and believe me it was almost impossible to decipher from the field names what the model was going to look like all right, so that's all there is for this. What we're going to do in the next lecture is start working through the relational joins that we want to form. So in other words, all of the different types of join will occur. And I apologize in advance. You may hear a jet in the background. It's late here tonight. It's rather hot. I have all the windows open, even though it's autumn. And the occasional jet happens to swing by. All right, so I will catch you later on in the next lecture. Okay, let's explore the types of joins you can work with building SQL queries for data analytics. Very important that you master your joins. These are pivotal to all of the data you retrieve from a relational database or a data warehouse, for example. If you understand this, then everything else falls into place very quickly. So the first one we want to cover, you would have heard the term join in your travels, most likely. The join is about, as it suggests, joining two or more tables together to retrieve a row set. Okay, so the first one we want to cover is the join. It's also the same as an inner join, so you can use the two interchangeably in your code. For clarity, I tend to code inner join in all of my join queries that require that type of join. Now, when we join using the inner join, what we're saying, what we're telling the SQL engine is that we want to find a match of rows in both of those tables, and indeed, if you had three, four, five, and so on. But that poses other scenarios, which we'll cover later. So fundamentally, we're going to join, in this particular example on the board, we're joining the product to the product inventory. So I want to get a list of all of our products that have a corresponding or a matching 
product inventory row. So what we'll return basically is I'm going to do my join using the product key. Now we have nice clean model data. This could be quite different in a scenario in real life where you're pulling in dirty data and you're busily scanning for ways to match things to ascertain some sort of model that you want to build some analysis around. When I do an inner join, I'm going to re return product A, product B, product C and so on. So the full list of products where I have a matching product A with inventory matching product B, C, and so on. So if I had, say, 5,000 products here, and there were only 4,000 inventory rows, then all that's going to return are 4,000 products, because we're only going to match on a one-to-one -one ratio. Okay, so this is known as cardinality, for example, in a model scenario. So for our match, it's a one-to-one. -one. There won't be any other combination here. It's purely matching rows from both tables. So let's get into the Management Studio and play with it. See you there. Okay, just jump into Microsoft SQL Server Management Studio, as we can see here. And you remember how to create a new query, just click the new query button. And let's just save this one. And you remember that we created a SQL Chapter 2 code snippets. Well, we can do one here for Chapter 3. So I recommend you create one of those. And we'll work within that chapter file folder. And I'll also put a copy of this up onto Dropbox for you to download and use during the lectures. All right. So let's just, for this one, I'm just going to call this inner join, a big pardon, let's call it select inner join demo. There we go. And maybe just a quick comment. Too easy. All right, now, as mentioned, the inner join is about matching rows from one table to another table, or indeed many tables. You can have as many inner joins as you like, or combinations of inner joins, left joins, and so on. But for this particular lecture, let's focus on a simple query. What I want to do is match all of the products to the product inventory here. So we've got a reasonably large product table. So as with all our all of our queries, let's build it piece by piece. So you remember I always do a select star from some table. I'm just going to drag the product table across. And if I run that, there's all of our products. 606 products we sell. Okay, so let's now pick a field we're interested in. So I want to just put the product name up there. As you can see, IntelliSense fills it in for us dynamically. And I might actually put a list price in there just to make it a little more interesting. And run that, and there's our two fields. Of course, we've got quite a few nulls in there. All right. Now, I want to join on the inventory. So what I'm keen to do here is in some way, and this is an introduction to aliases, in some way I want to uniquely identify the table that I'm joining on. All right, so I'm going to issue an alias that I like. I'm just going to use the abbreviation prod. Now, then I will issue the inner join. Now, of course, I could simply issue a join and you can perhaps try that, but they're both functionally the same. And now I'm interested in the product inventory, so I'm going to drag that across. You remember from our whiteboard, I was interested in joining on the keys. So you'll see in a moment the model will appear. And there's the product. And there's our product key. So let's give this an alias as well. So I'm just going to call this inv for inventory. You can use any alias you like, whatever suits your coding style. 
Now I need to tell her what are we joining on. So of course we've specified that we want to perform an inner join, but we haven't told the query engine, the database engine, what we're actually going to join on. In this case, we're just interested in joining on a single field, which is the product key. But you can add more fields to your joins as your data model allows. So you might have some other um, interesting fields you want to join on, which narrows down the data set that's being returned. And of course, you can use predication here as well, such as the where clause. So what I'm now going to do is tell it that I want to bring in the prod product key. So there's our alias. And if I do type in prod dot, now we've got a list of all of the fields. But I can continue typing here. So if I just do prod, see how the list starts to narrow down according to what we've typed in. Now I'm going to tell it I want to perform an equi join. So I'm issuing an equals. So product key equals inventory. So this is the second part of the table in the join. And there's our alias. Again, start typing and it's just found a single instance of a prod or product field. So it's added product key there. Now if I hit F5, we can see that it's worked quite happily. Now there's a lot of data there and as you can see down the right hand side here, it's taking a little while to run. All right, that took nine seconds and it returned 776,000 or so rows. If I just scroll down, we can see we've got some null list prices there. That's fine. We knew that was happening. So in this instance, we noticed that our row count is the same as our inventory count. This is because this is a nice clean database and there's a matching inventory row for every product. And I'd expect to find this in a decent ERP system anyway. So let's, let's just add one more field there for uh, interest. I'm interested in, of course, from an inventory point of view, let's have a look at the stock on hand, which is the unit's balance. Okay, so there's all of our stock on hand. Now, this is a very simple example. It doesn't really provide any great insight, but what it does demonstrate is the simplicity of an inner join. Now, of course, when we get to the end of this series of lectures, I'll build up quite a complex inner join for you to play with so that you can see some insight coming back from the data. But it's the old, you know, you can't run before you walk, you can't walk before you crawl. So let's, we'll just build this up piece by piece. And that's all there is involved with a join. Now just to demonstrate this again using a join rather than an inner join, I can just copy and paste, remove the inner, just take note of our row set, in fact even take note of the very first row. And that was our row, pretty much all the same in this instance for the ML bottom bracket. Of course if you had a date key in there, which in fact we'll probably Put it in anyway that way it differentiates it doesn't look like it's all duplicated data does it there we go there's all our different dates so each day in 2013 for april it looks like we had the same stock levels so we didn't shift much stock during that period i think that's fine we'll analyze this further on into the lecture series and i'll just put a date key into here and look at that we're running into nearly eight minutes already plus what is in the beginning. So there's our join without the inner specified and of course notice on the right hand side 776,000 rows and there's our first row. So the two are functionally the same. Of course when you're writing great big long queries you know um, it's well worth putting in a join in this case because you might have other types of joins mixed in with your query and it's always nice to see, especially if you're coming into somebody else's work, it's nice to see how the joins are formed if they're nicely articulated. All right, well, that's probably enough for the inner join. The next lecture, we'll look at the left join, so I'll see you in there. All right, let's look at the left outer join, also known as the left join. You can actually leave the outer out of your script line 
it's up to you, but if I'm writing a lot of code, I tend to try and keep it compact, so I just do a left join rather than a left outer join. That also applies to full joins and right joins. We'll explain that later. So with the left join, my mission is to get a customer list, a full customer list. In other words, every single instance of a customer on this table, and I want to know what city they live in. If they don't have a city there, I don't care. I still want the full list of customers. In this instance, I'm going to do a join. Again, we have this nice clean database. I'm going to join across the geography key and I'm going to return all of my customers and all of their cities. Now, if I don't have a city, we'll have a customer, say Jones, and what will appear next to Jones is a null if there's no city there. Okay, so it's very simple. Everything from the left-hand table, anything matching from the right-hand table, if there's nothing there, then a null will re be returned in your row set. So let's get to the Management Studio and play with that. See you there. Okay, let's have a look at the left join now, or the left outer join. So just shut down your previous session file if it's still there and create a new query and I'm just going to give it a comment so let's say demo the left outer join in a select and we'll save the file in our chapter 3 now I'm going to cheat here I'm just going to over the name and I'm just going to select be careful when you do this you can inadvertently overwrite the file Okay, so my intention here now is to form a list of all of my customers and their matching cities. So in this case, I have to match on the geography key. I notice it's a foreign key in customer because the customer isn't the driving force for the geography list. It's the geography table. So the geography key has been specified here as the primary key. All right, so as always, we do our foundation selection, select star from a table, thus customer. Now, because I'm going to form a join, I know intuitively I'm going to create an alias here. In other words, our shortcut name or our nickname for the uh, table. And I'm interested in the last name of the customer. And perhaps I might include the gender and that's it that will do I'll just run that and there's all of our last names gender now in this case I'm going to do a left outer join so reiterating I'm interested in retrieving all of the customer rows and their associated city by using the geography key to form the join so let's drag the customer across, I should say the geography across, there it is. And I'll give it a alias called Geo. And what I want to join on, and this is the key part, on is always our keyword here because I have to tell SQL what am I joining on, not just what am I joining. Now I'm going to take the geography key from the customer and of course, you'll notice it's now put a little red line, see that, ambiguous column name. Now, just to recap, if you had an ambiguous column name error up here, it means it cannot resolve the name because, for example, if last name was also in the geography table, it wouldn't know which one to select. So what it means by ambiguous is it doesn't know which table to look in. Now we do know in customer and geography, we have geography key repeated in both. So I have to tell it what context or what alias shall I use. So in the first part of the query, I'm interested in the customer geography key. I'm forming an equi join as we discussed in the inner join lecture, because I'm making customer geography key equal to geo, which is our shortcut alias, nickname, whatever you want to call it. In the old days, we called them context variables. And we want to relate the geography key, so we just start typing it in, and there we have it. 
Now, we do need a city. Now, I could actually type geo.city here. That's fine. Or I can just leave the geo off. Depends on, as I say, whether or not there's repeated names across the tables. You don't want the ambiguity to exist. Let's run it. And there we can see all of the last names and their city of residence. Now, if we scroll down, there we see a last name of Martin, who is a female, but has no city. So this customer, we do not know where they're located. Now, if this wasn't an online a set of online data, then we'd probably say, well, they just bought something over the, over the counter somewhere and they didn't provide any name and ad or address details for that customer. And then if we keep scrolling down, there we can see our full set of data. And we know we have 14,484 rows. Okay, so we've got the list of customers regardless. And wherever there's no city, there's just a null in the right-hand tables list. Very, very simple, very straightforward. That's how it's done. And of course, you can mix these with other joins as well. They're not confined to a single join. So just demonstrating the join only. So previously, that's an outer join. I can just remove that outer and there we have it, just run that. It still works. There's still the same number of rows. Somewhere down here we'll find some nulls. There we go, there's one. Okay, so that person doesn't have a city. So we're not, aware, we're not actually aware of where they live. So that's really in essence the left join, the left outer join. Get me everything from the left hand table, in other words customer, and try and match it on. In this case, we're lucky to have customer uh, geography key across the two tables and do the match. Now, of course, not always are you gonna have a clean database that's been nicely modeled with foreign key uh, primary key, foreign key relationships defined for you. Very often you're gonna be bringing in messy data, data that's sitting in CSV files, Excel files, other databases, fragments of other databases, so you'll spend a significant amount of time loading it up into a temporary database and then profiling it and trying to derive some sort of model. So, and this is all data preparation and cleansing process, which, which is where a lot of our time as uh, data analysts, data scientists indeed as well, will spend cleansing data, really. All right, so that's the left-hand query or the left-hand join. Let's have a look at the right outer join in the next lecture, so I'll see you there. Just like our left outer join, we can do the opposite. We can do a right outer join very quickly and easily. In this instance now, I want to get a full list of all of my cities and match on any customers. So you remember from the left hand join, I got all of my customers and any matching city. And if there wasn't a match for the city, I'd see a null in this part of the list. The other way around is that I'm going to match my cities by the geography key to my customers. So what I expect to see is a full list of geography keys, or I should say cities, and then any customers that reside within those cities. And where I don't see a customer, there'll be a null value there. So this is just like the left join switched around. And this can be handy for profiling. So I want to do a count of cities with no customers. So if my sales manager said, where are we not selling our products? I can easily tell them by saying, well, these are the cities we don't sell in or have any customers resident in. Okay, so let's go down to the management studio and play with it. See you there. Okay, let's demonstrate the right outer join. We saw with our left join that we could select all of our customers regardless and any city they reside in. Now, we want to go the other way around. We want to display all of the cities and any customers that are matched to those cities. Right, so we'll just shut down this file. We'll create a new query. Just put a comment in there. I'll just quickly save that ready for Dropbox. 
and I'll just rename that. How's the weather wherever you're sitting watching this at the moment? It's quite hot here still and we're into autumn. And it's going to be about 32 degrees today. All right, so let's move on. Just talking about geography aimlessly. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is, as always, I'm just going to build my basic query. So I'm doing a select star from customer. So that's the first part of our query. There's all our customers. And I'm just interested in the last name. I'm just going to key that in there. And perhaps I might look at, uh, just to make it interesting, let's have a look at the yearly income. Now this could tell a story at some point later on with some further analytics, giving you a demographic of incomes across geographies. OK, so I'm going to call that cust. Now, I want to join on geography, so I need to issue a right outer join because it's geography that I'm actually interested in listing all of the cities from. So it's the primary listing table. So let's just drag geography up there. Don't forget our aliases. So I'm going to call it geo. And of course, we've got to always specify the on keyword. We need to tell SQL what fields or attributes we're going to join on. So in this case, the first thing I'm looking for is the customer. When I learn to type, cust.geo, you can just start keying it in. IntelliSense gives you that little drop down list, which is really handy. I'm going to form an equijoin here because I'm basically saying I want to match, or in other words, the customer geography to match the geography, geography key. Okay. Now, let's just key in geo. Because it's a right join, we're telling the engine that this is going to be the primary list. In other words, this is table two. And table two is the result set, in other words. And then where we don't get anything out of table one, in other words, the customer isn't in that city, then of course we'll see nulls. So let's carry on typing. And I might just put the city in there because I think that would be pretty handy. And there's our query. If I just run that, and as we can see, now let's scroll down. All right, now there's some nulls. So basically what this is telling us is that we have a city called Aurora and there are no customers there. So if our sales manager or marketing manager was interested in some sort of analytic across here, we could actually say, return a, a row set that is a count of all the customers across the cities. And of course, these are going to return zero. So that in itself tells us that perhaps our marketing isn't targeting these particular areas terribly well, or they're not interested in our products. So it's again, as I stated on my whiteboard, all data tells a story. All right, now just to quickly recap the you do not need to use right out of join. So just to prove that, just remove that. And there we go. Apologies for the background noise. There's a few jets flying over today. They're all heading south where it's cooler. OK, so let's have a quick look again. And there's our nulls. Scroll back up to the beginning of the list. I know I'm being tedious. All right, so we can see we've got quite a lot of cities Still the same result, basically, but I've just cut out the outer. I'm not interested in typing long strings, as you probably guessed. I like to keep things quick and simple. All right, so that's the right outer join. Very, very easy, very straightforward. And I think the next one we're going to look at is the full join, the full outer join, which is a combination of the right and left join. So we'll have a look at the results from that in the next video. See you there. Okay, here's another interesting one, the full outer join, aka full join. The full outer join is a combination of left and right join in the single query. So for example, if I want to, as we did in the left join, I wanted all of the customers regardless and any matching cities that they live in. And similarly with the geography in the right join, I wanted all of the cities and the customers. Now either side of the list had nulls in them. In the case of the full outer join, I'm actually going to get both tables listed regardless. So I potentially will see nulls in the geography list 
and nulls in the city, uh, sorry, the customer list. That way, I can, from a profiling point of view, I can see if there's orphans in my data. So, for example, if I was doing this across products and inventory and saw orphans in the product list, but not in the inventory list, I'd be concerned we have some issues with our database. All right, so the full out of join means that I'm going to join the geography key, but in both directions, so to speak. So I'm going to have all of my geographies here, all of my customers here, and I may have nulls in this part of the list, and I may have nulls in this part of the list. So let's get into the management studio and play. See you there. Okay, let's have a look at the full outer join. I'm just gonna shut that one down, create a new query, quickly save it to our area and make sure it gets onto Dropbox for you. That full join, and here we go. Now full join is where we're going to actually join or combine all rows from the left table, which is table one and the right and table, table two. And basically, if there's no match across the two tables, that's fine, we'll still include all of the rows. So we'll see nulls on the left-hand side, and nulls on the right, where a match is not made. So let's quickly build up our query. It's very straightforward. Again, using our basic building blocks. So I'm gonna do a select star from customer. I'm going to give it a alias. Okay, perhaps I'm rushing, which I shouldn't do. All right, there's everything we want. Now I'm going to bring in the last name. And I'm interested in perhaps their total children. How many kids are still, or how many children they have in that family. And we'll just run that. And as we can see, there we have last name, total children. And I'm going to, and again, this is information that could be handy for analysis across, again, number of kids, kids at home and so on across a demographic. It helps the marketing team decide on campaigns for targeting sales. All right, so I'm gonna now do a full outer join. And a table of interest, of course, is our geography. Our alias is geo. And as always, I must specify the on, which is the keyword telling SQL what we want to actually join on. Not what we want to join, but what we want to join on. So this is the conditionals, if you will. And I'm going to form an equi join here because I'm interested in matching customer, I beg your pardon, matching key geography key equal to the geography key in geography. Should have called it something else, I think. Be a tongue twister. And let's just return the city. And while we're at it, why don't we return the country? So do we have a country here? Country region name, perhaps. And let's just run that and see what it reveals. Yes, we did get that. Now, there's a lot of data there. There's 18,000 or so rows. Let's just sort it to see if it actually reveals anything more readily from a visual standpoint. So I'm just going to order by city. And there we go. So now we have our customers. We don't have any information about their locations. So consequently, the right-hand table has been left with nulls in the list. And similarly, we have cities in countries that have no customers. So we'll see nulls in the left-hand side of the list. And just scrolling through, we'll see patterns of data accordingly. So there you can see the full join, the full outer join has revealed data on both sides of the query. And it hasn't left anything out. Everything is there, so. And this is very handy if you're doing profiling, for example, you want to get an understanding of things that might be missing. I could have done this across, say, um, if this was a badly designed database, I could have done this full join across the inventory table, which is our stock on hand level recording, and the products. Now, what if I'd seen 
nulls in the product list, but inventory values on the inventory side. So you can see straight away that there's something wrong here, or potentially sales information and no customer or accounting values. So, you know, the full join can be very handy for profiling and revealing anomalies across your data. Now, just to quickly demonstrate, you can do this without the outer. You've probably gone, probably yawning by now and going, oh yeah, we know. So let's just remove that and just pull that up. And there we go. So it's exactly the same row set. So that's uh, a very quick introduction to full joins. And what we'll do in the next one, the next lecture is have a look at the cross join. Now the cross join has some interesting points to raise with that one. I'll see you in that lecture. Let's have a quick look at the cross join. Now, whilst it's called a cross join, it doesn't actually join anything. So there's no corresponding join across keys like we do in our other joins. So the terminology is a little misleading. What the cross join does is it returns what's known as a Cartesian product. You may recall this from high school math. The Cartesian product fundamentally is a multiplication across the two tables. So for example, in our sale, uh, customer table, we have 18,000 or so rows. In the geography table, we have 656 rows. That times that is around over 12 million rows. But you can imagine if we had 100,000 rows in the sales table and we were doing a cross join to another table that had 50,000 rows in it, then of course it becomes problematical. The Cartesian product from that would be enormous. Now this is something that your DBA or data architect is going to be quite cross about if you, excuse the pun, if you actually do one of these on a data warehouse or a live system. So you have to be very careful with the cross join. That's the biggest issue is the performance of this. The cross join itself is, as I say, it doesn't really do a join. It returns for every single row in this table, the left hand table for example, it'll return a combination of rows. So that could be 1 times 656 rows. And of course as you iterate down 18,000 rows you're going to see how big it gets. In fact, if I run that query, just doing a straight cross join across these tables on my PC, it just sits there, query running, 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 and you can leave it forever. And well, it'll come back eventually, but you know it's not productive. So on its own, the cro I'll demonstrate the cross join in this lecture. But on its own, it doesn't give you any insight. But it is very useful for other types of analysis. And when we get to a complex join, which is in a few lectures time. I'll demonstrate how we can use the cross join in association with a left outer join as well. So we'll quickly go into the SQL Management Studio, demonstrate the cross join, have a look at the performance, and then once you understand what's going on there, we'll demonstrate a more complex join using the cross join to derive some insight from our underlying data. So I'll see you in the Management Studio. Okay, as promised, I want to demonstrate the cross join for you. So let's just shut down this one, create a new query. We'll just put a quick comment in here and we'll save it. As mentioned on the screen, on I should say on the whiteboard, I don't know why it's called a cross join because we're actually not joining anything. I'm thinking that it's called a cross join because if we do this, we're going to make our DBA very cross, especially on large table sets. But anyway, poor attempt at humor, wasn't it? So we still build up the query as we would in a normal join statement. So if I do a select star from, and I'm going to do a cross join over our customer and geography. So let's see what happens. So there's our customer information. Let's be specific. I want last name and perhaps, if I can get my typing online today, I might need another coffee, I think. Last name and let's say gender, not that this has any bearing on what we're going to display. So I've got those two fields. Now what will happen in, in the other queries we saw, such as the left hand join we, to the uh, geography, we, we might have seen a city in here, all right? But Yang lives in a specific city, Huang lives in another city and so on. 
But watch what happens when we do a cross join. So I'm still going to, out of habit, I'm going to use the alias. I'm going to issue the cross join. In other words, I'm going to make my DBA cross for issuing this statement on the data warehouse server. And all I have to do is that. All right, I don't require this, so there's no joining on anything. It's a simple return. And I want the city. Now watch what happens when I fire this. You'll notice that Mr. Yang here lives in city Alexandria. Huang also lives in Alexandria and so on. And that will happen for each and every last name. This combination, this matrix, if you will, across the two tables. We know that these people don't all live in Alexandria, but this is what the cross join is returning. So as you can see, it's, it just goes on and on and on. So that's going to return 18,000 last names with Alexandria, all right? And then the next, uh, the next city in that geography table will have another 18,000 usernames or last names. So as you can see, it's going to get bigger and bigger. Now, I just wanted to keep that running to demonstrate. So it's run for 1.35 minutes or 1 minute 35 seconds. It's just horrendously big. Let's just quickly scroll down. We might be able to get a row count. So already it's run ooh, 8 million rows. You know, that's this will come back. I know there's about 12 million, so it's going to take a few minutes. But you can imagine how how this would be on a server. This would this will kill the service. So at the end of the day, your DBA is going to come back and say, what the heck are you doing? And I've been a DBA in the past, and I've monitored compute intense queries by perhaps not so experienced developers or data analysts that are literally clobbering the system. Anyway, I won't rabbit on about this. This is what a cross join looks like. There is nothing really else to show you for performing from a syntactical point of view, performing this. It doesn't have a lot of use in its present form. Look at that, it did actually come back. It took 2 minutes 32 seconds and returned 12,125,000 rows. So that's quite a significant amount of data. But we can use this to our advantage, and in a few lectures' time, I did, I'm going to go through a few complex joins to provide insight as a result of performing different types of joins. And the one I really would like to demonstrate is this one across our inventory. See you in the next lecture. Hi, welcome to chapter four. This is the getting started with SQL for quantitative analysis. Within this section, we'll work through a number of aggregation functions that are available to us within SQL, and then some other little tricks and tips that I'll have within there as well. There is a new database for Chapter 4, so in this particular lecture, I'm going to walk you through the download from Dropbox and the restoration to the database environment. See you there. OK, let's get the Chapter 4 files. So normally, as you recall, you will be on the browser video player. Hover over it, click Resources Available button, and we should see our Chapter Database link and our Chapter Scripts link. So let's grab the Chapter Scripts first of all. And there's our files, three files for this set of lectures. And of course, the SQL for Punk Analytics has a significant number of extra lecture features there, so feel free to enrol in that course. Yes, another plug for my other course. And let's just do a download. Download a zip, and then down on the left-hand side of our browser, show in folder, and we'll just move it to Chapter 4, and we'll just extract it accept the default. You should all know this by now, so it's all good. So there's our three files, and you can keep those and play with them as you see fit. I'm just going to delete that folder to keep it all neat and tidy. And that's it. So now all we have to do is go back to our database, and we click that, and we'll be able to download the database. So after you, and there's our chapter 4 insurance.bak. Again, another SQL backup. This data has 
content in relation to some insurance information. So we're going to do a little bit of work in that database to keep things interesting. So let's download. This is a fairly small database, a couple of seconds to download and we are done. We'll just show that in the folder and we'll just move it into the chapter four. And now we'll go into our management studio and perform the restore. So as always, click on databases, right mouse click to do a restore database. Bingo. So let's see, what do we have? We're going to click on device again because it doesn't know about this database backup at this point. Click the ellipsis, accept the file, click add. And of course, we don't care about the SQL Server environment for our restores. Click the Hitchhiker's Guide. This is the SQL for Punk Analytics above it. So if you want to get involved in that course, feel free to ping me for a discount voucher. That course actually covers a great deal of detail for analytics inside SQL. So you'll be able to enhance your skills there. Anyway, that was enough of a plug. So here we go, chapter four. I'll just select that, click OK. I'm just going to accept everything because I know I'm fine here. Click OK again and let's have a quick look at the tables. And we have a calendar, an enterprise, which is the employers for the member policies. And I'll discuss this further anyway when we get into those lectures and members claims cover. So it's basically business data, fictitious business data around an insurance company. OK, so let's now jump into the lectures for this chapter. I'll see you in there. So in this lesson, we'll explore how to use the count function in SQL. We use count to count items within a group. See you in the management studio. All right, now we're in the management studio. Let's take a look at the count function. As always, the file is saved in the Dropbox area. And for this lecture, it's the select count function demo. And it'll be in the chapter four code and scripts ready for you to utilize. OK, so for this particular set of demonstrations, we're going to look at chapter four insurance. And of course, we have our base query here. So we'll just run that. And as you can see, we've got a lot of data. But we'll start to single things out based upon what the business is asking us. So the policy manager wants a count of members by gender. Well, let's answer that question very quickly for them. First thing we do is use our foundation query and we're going to issue a count function as simple as that. Now, if I just run that as it is, we'll see how many rows. So look down here, 10,663, run it, there's the answer. But we want to go a little bit further there. So we actually want to include the gender because it'll split across the gender by count, if I can type. And I might just put here G count, for example. And we need a group by. And of course, it'll be gender. So at the risk of reiterating or repeating myself, always remember the group by whenever you're doing an aggregation of any form and you introduce another column into that algorithm. Just run that and as we can see we have 7,900 odd males and significantly less females. So there's quite an interesting ratio there. All right, so that was very straightforward. The policy manager has also come back and now wants a count of all of the distinct occupations. So in other words, if pilot is recorded 50 times in there, he only wants to see it once. So this is where we can actually introduce the distinct clause into our count. So to do that, again, our foundation query, I'm going to issue a count and I can wrap inside the function, and we've seen this elsewhere, the distinct clause. And distinct, of course, requires an expression. In this case, it'll be looking for the, the occupation. So I plug that in there and I'll call that unique occupation count. And naturally, we probably, yeah, we don't need a Certainly don't need a group by there because we're not using any other columns. Let's just run that. And there we have it, 237 unique occupations. So we've done a bit of work so far by answering those questions. As long as the policy manager's happy, we're happy. Now he's come back. He suspects we have duplicated business keys in there. 
So that's going to be a little bit more involved, but we're still going to use the count here. So again, let's use our base query. And the way to do that is simply we're going to issue a count. And you remember we have the business key. So this is the actual key that comes in from the source system. This isn't an ID that's generated dynamically by the database. And I'm going to count that as count mem biz key. And I could just run that. And that should give us, as expected, 10,663. Now, let's include the business key because we're going to need to know what business keys are duplicated. So I'm just going to type in member business key. And naturally, a group by is required now. So we're going to group by member business key. Now you've probably heard me use the term having as a filter within a group by clause. Well, that's exactly what we're going to do here. So we're going to issue a having clause. And having is fairly self-explanatory. It's having some characteristic that we want to filter by. And in this case, I'm going to actually repeat the count because the count is a part of the filter. But I'm going to test the count. So in this case, I'm going to test it to be greater than one because in theory, I should only have unique business keys there. If we don't, then we need to talk to the host system or whoever's extracted this data and populated the database for us. So I'm going to order by two and then run it. And here we can see 225 rows that have duplicates. So that's very interesting. I wonder why we have duplicates. So we have to basically look at our data at some point to establish why this data is so dirty. OK, but that's at the business key level. When we loaded the data, we gave it a unique ID. So there's no actual duplication in this primary key here. But it does answer the question. And we could simply export this by right mouse clicking, copy with headers option, and save it to a file, such as a CSV, etc. All right, moving right along. So the next question is the policy manager wants a count of members spread across the countries. So we do know we have some policy holders that actually live overseas besides Australia. So again, it's a simple query using the count and a group by. So let's just do a copy. I think by now you're probably getting the gist that uh, things are fairly simple as far as counts are concerned. In fact, most aggregations in SQL, and these aren't just SQL Server aggregations, they're used in the majority of the, the main SQL-based products like Postgres, MySQL, and so on. So they're fairly straightforward. The only complexity is where things start to get into some fairly large and complex joins, etc. All right, so let's have a quick look at count. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to count the country as count country. And we'll see what that returns. There are 230 countries. So our members are spread across quite a large portion of the globe. Interesting. Anyway, that answers that question. Up to now, I've been telling you that if you want to do a count and you're introducing other columns to the column list, then you're going to need to do a group by. But I could tell you that there is a way to do this without using the group by, and that's by using the over and partition. Now, this is a very cool little piece of information to learn and use because it's not just for counts. You can use this for all types of aggregation work that you do. So let's have a look. We have a query from the sales manager. He wants a list of all the product counts within each online sales order. So he's trying to figure out who are the big orders, what are the big orders are about. So I'm going to need to use the chapter three sales. So I have this in the script. You have it as well. You just highlight it and then run it using F5 or execute. It has now put me into the sales database that I'm interested in. I'm interested in the online sales. So let's just have a quick look at what the query would look like. Let's build it up from scratch. And I'm going to do a select star from that one. If I do that, 
there's all my data. There's 60,000, eventually it'll come back, 60,398 rows. And what I'm interested in is doing a count. Now let's work out what we have to count. So the, the managers ask for a product and sales order. So let's bring the product key. We've always got to think analysis, not just the technical. Okay, so we're going to do that. And then he's interested in the sales order. So let's drag that across. Let's run it. Of course, it's going to fail, isn't it? Bang, it's looking for a group by. I don't want to use a group by. So I'm just going to simply use the over clause. Okay, it takes arguments, so I'll just leave them blank for now as some field name. So let's call it prod count and run it. Looks pretty good so far. No group requirement, but look what it's done. It's, it's exposed the whole set of data to, to the count function. So we have for every order, 60,000 as the count. Now that's not going to answer the question. So we need to extract it a little bit further. So now we use the petitions. We set a window, so to speak, within the context of what we're trying to count. So the way to do that is use the petition, if I can type, by clause, okay, and tell it what you want to petition by. Sales order number is what I want to petition. And of course, the analogy here is if I was using the group by, I'd be grouping on sales order number. So this is kind of like the group by. Okay, so if I run that now, what will happen? Okay, we're getting somewhere, still looking a bit, yeah, 60,000 rows still there, so it's still giving me the whole row set. I'm just going to order by to descending. All right, so now we can see that we're getting a mix of counts. So I've got four products in this order, but gee, they're all duplicated. It still looks a bit messy. I don't want to give my sales manager this data for whatever purpose he has in mind. So what I need to do a little bit further now is I want to make all of these distinct. So let's do that. Now I can issue a distinct clause. And what we'll see now is the distinct is acting on the petition. Now we have removed those duplicates. Now the sort order I've ordered by sales number. Let's change that and order by one descending to see what the highest. In other words, it will answer that part of the sales manager's question. Bingo. And we can see we have three orders here with eight products within them. How about that? Pretty straightforward, pretty easy. So basically, if you want to do a count without a group by, then use the petition. It gives you a great deal of power. So that brings us to the end of our counting. So I'll see you in our next lecture. Bye for now. So in this lecture, we're going to look at the sum function. The sum function returns the sum of all values within a group or all distinct values within the group. So let's get into Management Studio and explore. See you there. OK, here we are back to the Management Studio, our favorite place. As always, this particular lesson is on a file that is in the Dropbox Chapter 4 downloads area. And the name is Select Sum Function Demo for this particular lecture. Now we have a message from or a request from our claims manager. He wants to know what the total claims value is paid for the death and TPD claim types during the year of 2014. OK, so death cover we know is life insurance, but TPD in our country and probably other countries, it's known as total and permanent disability. So if you have a bad accident and your insurance covers you, then if you can't work or do anything again to earn a living, then that TPD payout will cover you. OK, so we have always a foundation query to start from. And as you can see, we have a lot of claims data within our database. So we have member key, the claim type, the course category, the claim course itself, and a number of other bits of information, such as the notification date and so on. So to answer this question, we need to break it down to its individual components. So let's firstly grab our foundation query. And what we should do here is we want to establish the year. 
So the first thing I want to display is the year, and we can use the year function. So there's a number of date functions available for you within SQL, and we can convert the claim paid date, for example, as this is the information we're interested in, and we can change that date to a year. So I'm going to call that year, and you'll notice I put it in brackets here because it is a function call, and if I wrap it up in either brackets or quotes, for example, then SQL won't try to interpret that in my query, as you can tell. So I've done that deliberately just to let you know what the issue can be if you use reserved words or verbs as field names. So be very careful in there. And we're interested in the claim type. Again, we know we want to use death and TPD, but we might display it here anyway, just for a little bit more clarity. So I'll inc include that. And I'm also interested in how much was paid. So I'm going to grab the claim paid amount using the sum. So this is where our sum aggregation is used. Again, it's just the function and an expression, the expression being a field. So I'm going to sum the claim paid amount and I'm going to name that as total claim paid. And then I will need to group by. So I'll issue the group by because I have brought the year in here and the claim type. Now I can actually use the year as the, so I'm going to group by the actual function in this example. As you can see, that is quite all right, but I've got to remove the alias that I've assigned it. And naturally I need a by. Clearly my typing's not good today. If I run that, okay, so it doesn't like the order by because I haven't included the year. So there's another catch for young players and me not being attentive enough. There we go. So that's part of what we require. However, you'll notice we have income protection, TIB, etc. included. We don't want that. So we have to now issue a predicate. I'm just going to do a where, and I want to use claim type now I could do this, I could say where that equals TPD or where and issue another claim type. This is a bit of typing, isn't it? This is a real pain, so and I don't like to type much. And we know death cover is DTH as a claim type, as we've seen there. Now that will work quite happily. As you can see, now we have DTH, TPD. We still haven't filtered out the year yet, but what I want to demonstrate is that I just want to do this. I'm going to use the in clause. So what I'm doing here is specifying a list that claim type can search. So for all intents and purposes, yes, it's a search list. So now if I run that, as you can see, a lot less code, still returning the same values. But in this instance now, I want to specify the year. So I'm going to go and use my year function here. It equals 2014 as requested, and I should have the answer now. So there's my answer, and that's what I'm going to return to the claims manager. He'll be happy. Okay, the claims manager has come back and has another request for a new list of data. In this case, they want the top five claim calls categories for claim type TPD for the year 2014, grouped by member gender. Interesting, how do we achieve top five? Well, this introduces a new clause that I want to show you because you'll use this quite extensively through your data analysis within SQL. The top five is achieved through the top n clause. Top n is a way to restrict the number of rows returned by the query. So it's very, very straightforward to use, but you must remember that the way you order your data or the fields or columns you introduce into the query can affect the outcome of the top n clause. So let's cheat by using the previous query with some modifications. So I'm just going to drag that. Don't worry about the order by shortly. Now I'm changing the order by because I'm more interested in ordering for the top five the actual total claim paid. So let's just do that one little fix here. 
and I'm going to order it by descending because I want to see the highest to the lowest. So let's just introduce top five. So the format is top, open bracket, close bracket. So it's looking for a numeric argument. So I can put in here, I could do top 100, top 25, anything I like. But the claims manager has asked for top five. So let's apply that information. Now let's run that as it stands now and see what returns. Okay, so it pretty much still looks like the previous query. We haven't made any modifications. We can just modify the list. You only need at least one value in the list to use the in clause, so that works quite happily. And just to demonstrate, there we have it, TPD. But we need the top five calls categories. So now I have to introduce the claim calls category, which we have here in our claims table. Okay, so let's just run that. And of course that won't work, will it? Because we haven't grouped by. Let's just introduce that into our group by and run that. What do we have? There we have it. Okay, so we now have our top five claim calls categories. But the manager wants the gender introduced. This is where we have to introduce a inner join and we'll introduce the member. And then I'm going to just bring in the gender. Of course, that has to be introduced into the group by as always so let's run that and see what appears okay so now we can see that our data has changed because we've introduced this new column we can see that cancer has been removed in other words the top n has filtered the or restricted the number of rows and because we've now introduced the gender the cancer categorization has disappeared all right, so that's the top five or the top N clause. It's very, very straightforward, but the gotcha here is you have to consider what is happening. Let's just comment these out. When you introduce other columns or indeed even change the sort orders. Okay, so now we see cancer has come back into it. So really, that's all you need to understand is that the columns you introduce into your query can influence the outcome of your result set. Let's visualize this now and have a look at how it appears. So here's a quick look at the data we've brought in through our previous two queries to answer the claim manager's questions. So there's our DTH and TPD paid in 2014. And then down here are the top five claims. Okay, so that will tally to our data. You'll notice cancer has actually been revealed here because the nature of the query underneath doesn't perform any aggregations or grouping. I do the top five within the ClickSense product itself. So this is just something to bear in mind. When you're doing something on SQL, then you have to consider how the query returns the row set. And then when you're actually going to bring that data into a product like ClickSense or Tableau, etc., then you're not going to do any aggregations prior to get it, getting it into this form and it will reveal different insight. The, the values will balance, but at the end of the day, you'll see that cancer hasn't been left out in my limitation here. All right, so let's move on to our next lecture and I'll see you there. So in this lecture, we're going to look at the average function within SQL. The average function returns the average of all values within a group. See you in the management studio to explore. Welcome back to our management studio. Let's explore the average function. First of all, this file for this lesson is in our usual chapter four Dropbox download area. The file is select average function demo. Okay, so we're going to work out or answer a question from our product manager. So the product manager wants to get an idea of the mean or average of insurance cover and the premiums paid across the age groups in the year 2014. Now you might recall from school to work out an average is quite straightforward. It's a summation of a list of number values divided by the count of those number values within the list. In theory, that should work across most scenarios, but in this case it won't, and let's demonstrate why. So let's take our members. We know that we have a number of members within the member table. Let's run a quick query to demonstrate that. We have 10,663 members. Now, 
We could assume that every member has cover, so let's actually make that assumption and build a query to try and answer the product manager's question. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to issue a basic query. And the first thing I want to do is do a sum. I'll just use the death cover in this case. And let's see what that gives us. Okay, it's quite a big number, isn't it? So we don't actually have any real predicate at this point. Let's issue a where. And we're interested in the underwriting year of 2014. And again, quickly run that. That's looking a little bit more reasonable for the death covers. I want to work out the average by members. So I'm going to use a very simple subquery here by issuing a select count star from our member table. And in theory, we should get the average cover. And you're probably thinking, no, nah, that's not going to work. So there's our average cover, $115,832. Yeah, I don't think I'm going to go back to my don't think I'm going to go back to my product manager and give him that information because I cannot be confident that I've calculated it correctly. But I have used a sound arithmetic calculation here. However, we have to consider that perhaps not all members have cover. So let's just do a select count. What I'm going to do here is get a distinct count. And we'll just grab the predicate from up there. And we should be able to see we have less. Okay, so let's just run this one again. So we can see we actually have more members than we do cover. And that's why this one showed us an incorrect value. Let's just move this query up to here out of the way. I'll just run that again for you so you can see the difference. Okay, so we're about 13. So that's, that's going to influence our average considerably. So what I can do now is just introduce a base query here. And there's all our cover. And we have death, IP, TPD, and so on. Let's have a look to see what the average is for death cover using the average function. So I'm just going to copy and paste the predicate and then introduce you to the average function. It's a very straightforward syntax. So in this case, I'm introducing average. And of course, we have our argument list. So an expression will go in there. So what I'm going to introduce is the average of the death cover. OK, and we can see now it's significantly different. So let's compare the two. So there we have it. 115,000 as opposed to 165,000. So that 13 members difference between the two tables has really influenced the average. So it's far more accurate to take the average in this way than it would be to use our standard high school arithmetic. Now, in order to answer the question, you wanted the premium and the age groups. So let's now introduce premium. So the death premium here is this. So let's just run that. OK, and we could probably do with putting some aliases or column names there. So I'm just going to issue as. But now we want the member age. So this means we now have to do an inner join across to the member table. So what I'm going to do here is just give that an alias in a join. Are you sick of joins yet? Don't be. The more you practice these, the better. Let's bring across the member. And I'm just going to put the age up the front. So I'm going to use the age from the member table just here. And I'm going to run that when I've put a group by, because now we're introducing a new column that is not having some form of aggregation across it. And I should be able to now see the breakdown. OK, so now I have ages. Now it looks a bit messy there, doesn't it? It's all over the place. So we could probably do with ordering. So let's order by member age. And it's starting to look better. So the average death cover for a youngster is 191,000. The premium is that. As the age increases, we see that the death cover tends to increase as well. All right. 
So that answers part of the question. He wanted to see all of the covers. So rather than watch you watch me type, I'm going to cheat and copy and paste the remainder of the covers in here. Let's run that. And now we have rather a large splat, even though it's only 68 rows, we have a lot of data in there. But I think we could do better by visualizing that. So let's have a quick look at how it looks in ClickSense. So let's have a quick look at a basic visualization of all of that tabular data. So now we can see in a little bit more detail the trends of the cover and the premium for total and permanent disability across the age range. The data is quite interesting. It could even be dirty as expected. And further analysis will reveal that. And as we can see in the later stages of the age group here, the data is very erratic. So has something gone wrong with the collection of the data? So as a data analyst, I'd start investigating around here to see what's going on. I don't really expect to see people later than, say, 65 with high TPD and other types of cover. So this is very interesting. So we'll have a look at the data as data analysts to investigate. So we can see across the age groups here that there's some increasing coverage once the 30 year olds come online. But it's fairly flat across all of the age groups, isn't it? So the mean of the premium is here again. We don't even see a great deal of correlation between the cover and the premiums. So that's another observation we can make. But anyway, this gives you a good indication rather than looking at raw data, gives you some indication visually as to whether the data requires further investigation. OK, so we're running out of time. Let's move on to the next lecture. See you in the next lecture. G'day, once again, welcome back, nice to see you. What the heck is a union? Well, I'm going to explain. See you at the management studio. Okay, welcome back to the management studio. This lecture is to answer the question, what the heck is a union? The union clause is the way to combine the result sets from two or more queries. Now, don't confuse this combination with a join. It is not a join at any level. All it does is take each row set from a query and combine it into a single row set. So let's demonstrate how this works. I have a query that is to select all of the suppliers from our supplier product supplier table that have a credit rating of one and I want to average their standard price. So in this case, the supplier table is what holds the credit rating information. And the product supplier with the standard price is what I'm interested in. So my predicate is going to be based upon the join. So my supplier join to my product supplier utilizes the keys, as we know from all of our join examples. But my predicate now is to get the credit rating of one. So let's just run that and see what it does. And there we have a list of 48 rows, in other words, 48 suppliers, their average standard price and their credit rating. But I also have a need to examine what the suppliers with credit rating four look like. What's their average standard price? Let's copy that in. So I'm selecting exactly the same query, but now I've changed the predicate to credit rating four. Let's run it. One supplier only has a bad credit rating. We rate our credit from one to five, one being the best supplier from a credit rating point of view. If I run that like such, so both are running sequentially, I get two row sets, don't I? That's kind of ugly. So, and indeed, I don't know where Prosware sits within this row set because this row set sorted by supplier name and this one is as well, but we don't see it in the sequence. So what we can do here is combine the two row sets using the union clause. So the union is going to not join, remember that, not join, but combine the two row sets. So I issue a simple union statement.
That's all that's required. And that's what you put between each and every select query. And it's not the only place that you can use union. You can use this for loading tables, updating data, and so on. So there's many uses. It's not just for a couple of select statements. But this demonstrates what the union is used for in terms of how it works. If I run it, now we can see we just have one row set. We don't see any other windows here. It's 49 rows, and there's Prosware. Now it's sitting in the context of all of the other supplier names. Now there's some caveats to remember. These are important. The union, by its own mechanism, will remove duplicates from these row sets. So if you suspect there are duplicates in the row set that you're returning and you want to keep the row set duplicates, then issue an all as part of your union. This way then, any duplicates will still show up in your union. The other caveats to remember are, you must have the same number of fields in the target lists. So I couldn't, for example, include this one. SUP active flag, for example, and I just must remember to include that in my group by here, which I've already done. And if I run that, it will fail, because what it's telling me is that all queries combined using a union, intersect, or accept must have an equal number of expressions in their target lists. So what we must ensure is that that active flag is also inside the second query. So let's put that in there. And of course, I must remember to group by. Let's run it. And the error's gone away. And now we've included the active flag in our display. So that's quite interesting thus far. However, I've decided I want to change the name of active flag and I'm going to save it as status. What will happen? I'll wrap that in brackets because it went blue, which means it's a keyword within SQL. And we try to avoid using keywords or verbs as field names. And I'll run that. Oh, look at that. It's still active flag, even though I specified here status. This is because the first query for all intents and purposes, can be described as the controller in terms of column names. If I want to rename or reassign a column name, I need to do it up here. So let's say I change that to say something else. Status 1. I still have as status down here. What will happen? Status 1 is what took the precedence. So any field names down here are going to be ignored by any field name references you make up here. So it's always worth caution when you're building your unions. Just make sure your field names that you use across the two are set accordingly. Make sure the data typing is set accordingly. If that standard price, for example, was coming from another table and it was, say, a string, and this standard price coming from this query was a number, you'll get an error. So it's about conformance. So just remember those points. And that's it. That's all that's required for unions. I'll see you in the next lecture. Welcome back. We have three lectures in this little mini-series. If you've ever heard of the term CRUD, CRUD basically means create, read, update, delete. The read we do all of the time. The minute we issue a select statement, we're reading the data. The other three statements relate to create, which is insert, and I'll cover that in this lecture, update, and delete. So the next three lectures will deal with CRUD. See you in the Management Studio shortly. OK, welcome to the Management Studio once again. Insert is a part of what you've probably heard used around the traps, the concept of CRUD. CRUD is create, read, update, delete. So that's got that out of the way. So, so in this case, the create is the insert. The read is, well, we've seen that in every other part of our course. Select is reading data. So we're selecting something to read it. Update is the U and D for delete. So this is a part of a CRUD enterprise, if you will. But the first cab off the rank is how do we do insert? And what is insert? Well, it pretty much answers its own question here. The insert is a way to insert data into a table. 
And we saw a demonstration of creating a table dynamically using the insert as a part of our query when we produce the sales by product summary. We also found that we can insert data to the database table by right mouse clicking on the table of interest and clicking the edit. And of course, editing this way is not a particularly efficient mechanism. There's two ways to insert data. There are, in fact, there are many ways to insert data. We can use external packages like integration services. We can use bulk load. There's a whole raft, but again, because we're data analysts, we want to do it on the fly, so we're going to use the most convenient methodology that we can. And of course, I tend to like the insert to a table via the select query. So let's demonstrate an easy one first of all. So I'm going to do an insert into, so that's what we issue. So we've seen that before, the insert into. What we're going to do now is we're going to insert into our customer demo table. Now what I have to do is, part of the insert is I have to tell it what fields I want to insert to. Now in this case we only have two fields. All right, so I'm just going to drag the customer key and I'm going to drag the customer name. That's great. So we've told the insert what we're inserting to and what columns we want to insert. Where are we getting our data from? Well, there's two ways to get it. One is by a static mechanism and the other is a dynamic mechanism. The static mechanism involves issuing a values, if I could type, a values statement and then we're going to tell it, inside brackets of course, what values we want to insert into these columns. So you must make sure of a couple of things. First, the data you want to return relates to the field that you're interested in. So in this case, the customer key. So I'm going to issue 20,000. The second one is I'm going to issue a name. Now we know the customer name is a string or a var car 50. So what I need to do here is ensure I wrap my characters inside quotes. And that's all that's required. Now, of course, in a large insert, you'd have a lot more fields and a lot more data. But really, I don't recommend using this mechanism as a standard way of inserting data. This might work for a handful of rows, for example. So if I do this and issue multiple record statements, so what I have to do here is separate a set of values. And if I make that 20,001, that will insert two rows. So what we do is we include our values in brackets. We set our fields equal to the ordinal positions here. And then we just keep adding more data. Now that's not an efficient, an efficient way to go. But let's execute it. And we can see that we've actually inserted a duplicate primary key. So we set that primary key for a reason. I wonder why that's occurred. Well, let's do a select max customer key from our table to see what number we should have to use. Again, this is all the sort of things that we'll encounter along the way as a data analyst. 29483, so I need to set my key here to something greater than that value so that I don't get that duplication. And there's another mechanism I want to show you briefly in here as well. So there's that insert, hit it, and now I've inserted those values. If I run this again, we can see the maximum value is the last key we inserted. Now I don't want all that data there, do I? So what I'm going to do is, getting ready for my next insert, I want to delete the rows from this table. There's two ways to do it. There's I can do a delete from my table and that will remove all rows. And that's fine, that's quite doable. But if that table had millions and millions of rows because you've done a, an enormous data analysis project, that actually can take some time to run because it has to iterate through every single row, write a row back to the log file and then delete it from our main data file. So that's not efficient. So what I'm going to do is I can issue a truncate. Actually, I'll leave that there for you to reference. I will issue a truncate statement. 
which is a whole lot faster. Now I don't have enough data to demonstrate the speed, but from my experience, I was on a large SAP migration project many years ago, and we had hundreds of millions of rows inside temporary tables that some of the migration specialists were using. And they'd come to me and say, hey, it's taking forever to do a delete. So what I showed them was how to do a truncate. So if you do a truncate table, I'll just copy that. What will happen then is you have to issue a table. So it's truncate table that it's instantaneous. Even if you had millions of rows there, it might only take one or two seconds. So that is a whole lot quicker than using the delete. But for our day-to-day -day exercises in SQL, this is fine. Now what I want to do now is show you another way to insert. It's similar to loading a new table from a query, but this case I'm going to do, this part of the query stays the same. But what I want to do now is I want to list all of the distinct customers that reside in my chapter three customer table. My insert stays the same, but what I'm doing here is replacing the values statement with a select statement. So here I'm doing a select distinct customer key from our online sales customer. And yes, I will add, oh, here we go, it's already added. I want the last name and the first name to make up the name field I want to insert to. So if I just run that, and don't forget, we want to specify the database context we're coming from, which is chapter three, because we're inserting into chapter seven. If I run that now, there's our list of customer keys, the distinct list. Well, we know there's no duplicates there, but it's worth using distinct just to be sure. Data is not always clean, as you'll find out. And I've added the customer last name, first name to the insert. So if I run that, it's inserted 14,484 rows, and I'm just going to do a select from there to demonstrate. And here we go. That's it. 18,484 rows of unique customer keys and the names of those customers there. Very, very straightforward doing inserts. I don't recommend using this unless you're just doing a handful of rows just for testing or reference table in your day-to-day -day tasks. But nonetheless, it's fairly straightforward as you can see. I tend to use these types of inserts a lot and that's far more efficient for me because I'm selecting the data I specifically require to populate my table. So I might have a predicate in there, say customer whose age is greater than 25. Okay, so what we'll do is end it here because we're running into overtime, almost, and we'll see you in the next lecture. All right, so in this lecture, we haven't covered loading raw data. So I'm just gonna walk you through the process of the import wizard so we can grab data. Very often as data analysts, we'll bring in data from all sorts of other sources besides nice clean databases. So I'll see you at the Management Studio. Welcome back to the Management Studio. Okay, one thing we haven't covered, importing data. There's always going to be a time when you want to bring in data from a raw data file. It could be an Excel file, a CSV file, a TXT file, you name it. Anywhere that there's a file with data in it is a potential for analysis. Okay, so to do this, there's no scripting required in this exercise, but there is a file, so I'll take you to where it is. It's the staff payroll CSV, and it's in our Dropbox area for chapter seven. So I've dropped it into there for you to play with. So what I'm going to do now is you'll notice on the database, if I right mouse click, there are a number of tasks available. Let's import data. It'll bring up a wizard and it gives you a number of connector options, .NET, for example, for ODBC, Oracle, SQL Server, and so on, flat files, access files, Excel, and so on. I'm interested in a flat file because this is a CSV file. So if I browse, I will find it in my SQL Server Management Studio area. Okay. I'm interested in CSV files, and there it is. So always specify the file type, double click, and it's done some basic analysis up front. It's kind of worked out some defaults. You notice here that everything is column, width, 50, text, qualified, 
and it's always going to output a string. Now you could play with this within the wizard itself, but I tend to leave it and accept the defaults. If you look in the columns folder or the columns option, it's given you a bit of a preview of what's in the data. Okay, so that's cool. I can pretty much get to a point where I just want to import that now. The column names are in the first data row, which is important. I'll click next. Now in this case, the target, so where am I importing it to? The target is SQL Server Native Client because I'm bringing it into my SQL Server database. Now this is a little bit proprietary. You'd probably have to, if you're working in an Oracle space, you might want to work in the, I think it's Toad you can use for interfacing with Oracle. And there might be some options in there. It's been a long time since I've played in Toad, so I apologize. Okay, so that's our client. There's our database. Because I was already in there, contextually speaking, it's picked it up for me dynamically. And indeed, if I drop the drop list, you can see all of our databases. And naturally, we're not going to do anything with those. All right, click Next. And you can rename the table if you require. So I'm just going to accept the default staff payroll 2015. You can change the mappings. So for example, if I want to change the field name it's going to, I can click in here and manipulate the field name. I'm just going to accept the defaults for this. I can also change the data type if I choose. So you can do a reasonable amount with this tool on its own, but I tend to just bring it in raw and manipulate it from there, from a, a staging table for all intents and purposes. So I'm going to click OK. Well, let's have a quick look at the SQL. There's the SQL. And that SQL is just to build the table. All right. Now I'm just going to click OK. Click Next. And again, yes, it requires a few verifications before it finally gets to it. And then click Finish. And there it is. It's loaded three and a half thousand rows to a new table. I'm just going to refresh it. And there's our table. Now, of course, everything is VARCAR 50. So you might want to actually utilize this table as the source for a new table, such as we did in our query to create the sales by product summary, and then start setting your, or do some profiling first to set your individual data types that you want to use. So for example, year month, I don't think I want to use VARCAR 50, same with year number. So it gives me a great deal of scope to improve upon. So this is really, to me, a staging area. And there's the data. OK, so it's pretty straightforward. So now I've got a set of data, 3,500 rows, that I can start looking into and doing some analytics across. All right, that's it for importing raw data. Regardless of the environment you work in, it's always a good idea to have a backup. Now this can be your file backups in terms of your individual PC environment. However, if you're working in a database environment, well, on an enterprise, you'll have a lot of processes in place that will do that for you automatically. But for your specific work, if you're working on your own PC or a development environment and you want a backup of your work at the database level, then you can do it here very quickly and easily. And I'll demonstrate the process. And I recommend you have a go at this because if you're just tinkering with queries or you're creating new objects in the database and you've come up with some ideas you want to look after in terms of protect, then you want to do a backup. The process is very simple. Just hop into your management studio and pick the database you want to back up. In this case, I'll pick the chapter three and if you just right mouse click on the database itself and click the tasks, then you can issue a backup. Now you're expert at restores now. So let's just do a backup of the database. And as you can see, there are a number of options available. It knows you want to back up the chapter three and it's specified a directory here. In this case, it's using what we've used previously, which is the chapter three data and scripts and it's using the .bak specification. We can add another one if we want to, but in this case, I'm just going to add to the one I already have. 
there are some options you might want to select. You can append this backup to the existing backup. So we'll do that. Otherwise, you can just overwrite, which will actually get rid of all of the previous backups. And you might like to click verify just to double check that the integrity of the backup has worked. I have seen backups work, but the quality of the data has sometimes become questionable and the restore has failed. But in our day to day exercise in this course, you'll probably find that you don't need to verify, but play it safe anyway. So what we'll do now is we'll just run that very quickly run as you can see. So I'm just going to click OK. Now we know we have a backup. Let's look at the properties and we'll actually see on the properties the last backup. And there we can see 10.59 a.m. on the 15th of April. Let's say we had some issues that we made some changes within the database a few hours down the track or a few days down the track. We decide we want to restore this specific database. Previously, we've used databases and right mouse click to do a restore. Or we can do the same thing in here as well. But ideally, I would avoid it because once you've got some access to this database, potentially it's locked and you won't be able to do anything with a restore. It will just hang. So I haven't actually performed any actions in here. So I'm just going to attempt to do a restore this way. If it fails, it'll demonstrate what can happen. So I'm going to do restore database. I'm going to pick from my, as you can see, it knows about the database backup we did this morning. There are other backup sets in here if we wanted to play with those, but I'm just going to select what's already there. Click OK. And it worked because I haven't previously done anything on the database to lock it up. If I, for example, got into tables and created a new query. Let's do one just to demonstrate what happens. We've got a few minutes to spare. So I'm just going to do a select star from, let's say, calendar, and I'll run it. Now we have what's known as an attach to the database as far as a transaction is concerned. So if I actually now try to do a restore, you'll be able to see what happens. So it knows about all of the database backup details we've seen before. Click OK and it's going to sit there. What it's trying to do now is make an exclusive connection to the database to restore it, but it sensed my presence. It knows I'm there as a transaction and it's just going to sit there. Eventually it'll time out and come back with an error. And there we go. I was just about to pause the video, but as we can see the restore failed. So if I just open up why it restored why it didn't restore, I should say. See here, exclusive access could not be obtained because the database is in use. In other words, that query I commenced, it knew about. Now, what will happen if I get rid of that query? Will the lock be released? Let's have a look. Do another restore. Can you guess? There's our details. Click OK. Fine. So it's sense that I've now removed that transaction. The backup process ha now has an exclusive lock for the restore and bingo, we're in business. All right, that was a very simple how to do a backup in a hurry and a restore. See you in the next lecture. All right, for this lecture, which is the last lecture of our chapter, we're going to explore the case statement. An analogy for the case statement would be an if-then-else construct within your SQL expression. Let's get into the Management Studio and explore. Okay, welcome back to the Management Studio. Okay, so we have a question from the Policy Manager. He has observed that the data in the member cover does not show a column for cover type. So how can we create a list of member covers that shows the cover type abbreviation, such as DTH for death, for the underwriting year of 2014. Well, this we can do using a case statement, and indeed we could do this later on to update that table and add a new field with the new abbreviation value in there, as this we know is dirty data, so this would be one mechanism to assist with cleaning it up. All right, so, there are two ways to use the case statement. The first one is a 
searched case expression. So within a select statement, the searched case expression will allow for values to be replaced in the result set based on comparison values. So that's a little bit more complex, if you will, but nonetheless quite powerful. And then the other type of expression is a single case expression. So within a select statement, a simple case expression allows for only an equality check. So no other comparisons are made. So answering the first question, let's have a look at how we can achieve this. I'll just add some notes here. And what we'll do is now work through answering the policy manager. So we'll quickly do a base query. So we're going to do a select star from our member cover. And we'll just set some predicates here to satisfy the, the requirements from the question. So we're looking for an underwriting year of 2014. And we're looking for the total death cover in this case. And we're going to tell it we don't want any null or zero valued death covers in this particular example. And we have around 7,480 rows satisfying the query. Now this is where we introduce our searched case. So the first thing we want to return is a member key because we're looking to su supply a list of values to the policy manager. He's probably going to go off and play with Excel somewhere. We want the total death cover. All right, that's repaired. And let's just quickly run that. And there's our 7,400 rows, death cover as such. Now what I need to do here is, because I'm using a searched case expression, the first statement I'm going to issue is a field alias. So I'm going to use the field alias of type, cover type. And then I'm going to put an, or an equal sign there to say that I want to equate the value output from the case statement to be contained within this alias. Okay, so to better explain, let's open up our case statement. So the case is simply a case and end, and we can actually add an else in there as well. So you can, any, if any of the conditions in the search do not occur, then we can set an else. So it's like an if then else at the end of the day. All right, so in this case, I want to test total death cover. So when it's not equal to zero, I'm going to assume that the cover type abbreviation can be DTH. It's as simple as that. Now, if I wanted to, I could put else in here, and, but it doesn't make sense because for this example, I'm just testing one specific value. But if I was doing it in all of the others, such as IP cover and TPD cover, then you'd probably want an else statement in there if there's no match. It really depends on how you understand your data. So that's really all that's involved with a search. So we're setting up a alias field name and we're setting a value in there based upon the value of total death cover where it's not equal to zero. Let's run it and see what we get. And there we have it, we've calculated the cover type and we could indeed do that for all of the others. But we won't do it here, it'll just drag on too long. Now the simple case expression is about, is about performing a simple equality check. Now the product manager has asked us to abbreviate the gender that is contained within the member table. So why don't we just do that using the case? So I'm just going to build a select star from, as always, our base query. Select star from member. And what we'll do here is we're going to grab the member key and we'll probably grab the gender. Okay, so I'm just going to issue, in this case, a case statement. Let's open and close it in the one statement here. And because it's an if-then-else with an equality check, you'll notice that we didn't include an alias there at the start of our, or just prior to our case. We're not actually putting anything into an alias at that level, but we will do it here. So we'll put an end gender abbreviation. Now, in terms of what we're going to test, we're looking at testing the 
gender and we're issuing the case there. So there's no search taking place. All that's happening is as each row iterates through the query, in other words, the select statement, then when, and I can type, the gender male, so now we're testing or doing an equality check on the value of gender, then we set the outcome. Then for female, then F. That's all there is to it. Now if we come across a missing gender or an unknown gender, we're just going to specify a question mark because we don't know how to translate that. Again, that's all there is to a case statement. Now later on in the, I think, chapter 7, I'm going to show you how to discretize data using the case statement. And discretization is very common across anything you do in data analysis. So let's just run that. And there we have it. So there's all our genders. And what we might do is actually put the gender in here as well, just to highlight what it's been abbreviated from. I'll run it again. Okay, so male has become M, female has become F. Very, very straightforward using a case. And indeed, you can use the case within a join, for example. You can set the case statement to be used anywhere you like. Okay, that's the end of the course. So I thank you for joining and partaking in all of the lectures. And hopefully I'll see you in the sequel for Punk Analytics. Don't forget, if you want a discount voucher, I can send you one, or you can find them in the scripts that have been included in this particular course. Thanks very much, and good luck on your sequel travels. Bye for now.